Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Farid Faraman, and I'm the chair of the electrical engineering program here at Sonoma State University. I'd like to really thank you for uh, joining us today, and um, it is really, we really appreciate your participation and your support. Um, today we have nine teams of students who are presenting their senior design projects. The order of projects is available in that flyer that you received as you entered. If you don't have one, please let us know. There is, we have one person in the back that's passing those out, so you kind of know who is going. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thank you so much. Um, the ideation phase of the senior design project really goes back all the way to August of 2016. So the students have been working on these projects for almost a year. Um, to tell you the truth, we um, had a couple presentations, in fact, the summer of last week. So literally, they started the working on these ideas behind their projects sometimes in May of 2016. So it is a, it's been a really, truly interesting journey for many of these students. Um, each team was required to have an industry advisor and conduct a marketing survey. In addition, teams were expected to have their own clients and write funding proposals for their project. Um, today's presentations really reflect their hard work and it demonstrates that truly how much time they have spent uh, on these projects. And because of that, we are truly proud of all of our, our students. Um, I would have to kindly ask you to save your questions until the end of each presentation. And um, unfortunately, because of the time limitation, each presentation is limited to 15 minutes. And it's really not fair. You, you're trying to bring down that one year of work in 15 minutes. But I really hope that during the break, you can have time. You go around and you talk to the students and learn more about their projects. Um, we, each presentation will be followed up by five minutes of uh, Q&A. So uh, unfortunately, after that, we have to go to the next project. And again, I apologize for that lack of having enough time to go over all the presentations. So with that, thank you again for coming. And uh, we start the presentations with the first project, the smart parking. Thank you. My name is Robert Wodkowski. I'm Nicholas Langworthy. And I'm Nate Horn, and uh, we're Smart Parking. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk to you about today. We're going to define the problem that we're facing. Uh, then we're going to give you the proposal of our implementation, talk about some tests we have ran, challenges we faced, and then we'll talk about the future work that can be done with this project, and then we'll end it with questions. One of the biggest problems here at Sonoma State is the lack of parking. In 2015, the city of Rona Park passed this ordinance restricting students from parking across the street in the neighborhoods, and that cre created an influx or a flux of students that came to campus and created a, a further problem of parking. This results in wasted time for both students and faculty, which causes them to be late to class, which affects everybody. Uh, there's already some existing work uh, for car uh, counting systems already that are implemented, uh, such as Red Storm Parking Guide. They use laser systems and enclosed parking structures to be able to count the cars going in and out. And there are other systems such as T2 or various other ones that use uh, magnetic induction coils. Uh, the problem with lasers is the sun can impede on the receiver sense so we can get false positives. And with the magnetic induction coils, uh, they require construction. You have to remove the asphalt and require large amounts of power. Uh, another project that was done two years ago uh, was called Prime Parking here at Sonoma State. Uh, they tried to do this. They were unable to count accurately. Uh, they used the gym sensor, which was highly inaccurate, and we, we believe this is why their project did not work. So since we found out that a lot of people are having trouble parking here, there's a couple solutions that we thought of. One of them was to add more parking. Well, that's a lame idea. So for our engineering side, we wanted to design a, not, a scalable, non-intrusive system that could detect vehicles in and out, and that way we could build a web page where you could go at home and see how many parking spots are available before you even leave your house. 
So the grand idea is to implement this at every every single parking lot. That way, when you leave your house, you know which lot to go to. But for our sake, we only had maybe a semester to actually implement this. So we're only focusing on lot G here over by the gym. So this is a zoomed in version of the parking lot G. We have two sensor nodes and a gateway node. At each sensor node, you have a two pneumatic tubes and two pressure switches. When a car goes over the first pressure switch and then the second pressure switch, you know the car is going in, we can count an in. When the car comes out, it hits the second pressure switch and the first pressure switch, you know the car is leaving. The way they, the sensor nodes communicate is wirelessly through XP communication. The sensor node one sends their count, its count to the sensor node two count. The sensor node two count does computation. It sends the final count to the gateway node. The gateway node pushes that data to the AWS cloud, which is our Amazon Web Services. And from there, we can create a web page using the, uh, the uh, AWS peripherals. So even zoomed in more, here we have the sensor node. There's two pressure sensors I've mentioned before. Our MCU, MCU we're using is a PIC-18. It is so solar powered. We use XP communication from here to here. Then on our gateway to the network, we're using a Raspberry Pi, which is just a little mini computer pretty much. And from there, we can push to the Amazon cloud using Wi-Fi. And in the top left, you can see the pressure switch we're using, and the bottom right is the Raspberry Pi. So on the left-hand side, we have a sample of our code, uh, what we use on our MCU. Uh, so it basically just waits to see which sensor is tripped first. Depending on if the first sensor is tripped and the second one, you know a car is entering. Uh, it'll wait X amount of time before anything gets cleared. Uh, the next, we have our transmit code. So we're using the frequency uh, stated on the PIC, which is 8 megahertz. It will wait for about uh, two, two minutes and then transmit to the second node. Once the second node receives this message, it'll take its own count, add it all together, and send the total count to our gateway. Going a little bit deeper on the sensor schematic, you can see the PIC-18 right here, the XB, and the two pressure switches. The pressure switches, were, we were having trouble with the bounce effect on them, so we had to add two capacitors, and Nate will talk about that more later. Uh, here's just a simple schematic of how we powered it using solar. We have a 5-volt solar panel, which is connected to a lithium-ion battery charging kit. That kit charges our 10 amp hour lithium ion battery, uh, and then we regulate that voltage and that power is supplied to our nodes. On the paper that we handed out, uh, in the back of the classroom, we have our requirement table. On the left-hand side, we have our marketing requirements. Uh, the middle column is our engineering requirements to meet our marketing, and the far right is our test that we did to conclude that our, we met our engineering requirements. A few that I wanted to point out was we wanted to make sure we had a programmable gateway and sensor node. Uh, and then also the wireless communication and a mobile web page. For engineering requirements, we needed to make sure we had enough memory on the sensors and gateway node. And then also the UART capability of the PIC mic controller to ensure transmission of messages. Uh, one, of the, one of the initial tests we did is we wanted to measure our power consumption. As you see here, we have our values that we measured. Uh, with the PIC's consumption, it uh, consumes about one watt of power when it's uh, using all of its pinouts, which as you can see, we weren't using all the pins. So when we did our math, we had about 15 amp hours to supply 48 hours of uninterrupted power supply without any sun. Uh, so we decided to use a 10 amp hour battery, which should be suffice for that amount of time. So <clears throat> one of the big things we needed to do for a scalable system is the communication. So we chose the XB S3B, which runs at 900 megahertz. To test the actual communication or packet loss on the XBs, we use a XCTU program. We tested the XBs at 415 feet distance between two entrances, and the XBs were located on the ground on our nodes. We found out that there was 30% packet loss. This is not a huge deal because we're sending small amounts of data as it's just numbers, and we're resending it every two minutes, so we're not really losing count. We might miss two minutes here and there, but it's not a huge deal. So we needed to make sure that everything was fast and accurate. So we used the interrupt capability to ensure that nothing was missed uh, via the trips on the sensors. We also made sure we didn't use a delay. Uh, otherwise, we, have, we run the risk of missing a car coming in or out. And then also we're using the frequency, count, uh, the frequency on the PIC to clear every counting variable to ensure if one sensor is tripped, but the second one's not um, for a false trip, it'll clear after three seconds of waiting. And then every two minutes, we're transmitting the message. 
Um, so as he just talked about the bounce, so as you can see here, this is our pressure sensor hooked up before we added the capacitor. And if you notice with this uh, picture here, you can see there's a, a bounce effect, which is uh, initiating multiple trips, which is highly inaccurate for our system. So what we decided to do is uh, we have a capacitor hooked up from the lead to the ground of the sensor itself, and that gave us a nice, nice smooth, very low standing, so it still came in as a low instead of a high, which is exactly what we wanted it to do. So here we have a full layout of our design for, via communication. So the yellow wires indicate our wireless communication between every, every node of our system. The blue is the wired up connections. So the node one's XB would communicate to node two. Node two would then send it to the Raspberry Pi. The XB on the Raspberry Pi is connected to the USB port of the Raspberry Pi, which is plugged into the outlet. The Raspberry Pi connects to Sonoma's Wi-Fi, uh, or you can plug it into the ethernet. And from there, it connects to Amazon Web Services for the cloud, which I'll talk about on the next page. So here, once the data gets pushed to the cloud, we save it in a table called DynamoDB. Uh, this way we can access it later and use it on our web page. Um, and uh, for further work we're gonna, that we're gonna talk about, you can save the data on there uh, to do trend analysis. On the right, or on the left, we have our sample web page. Every time you hit the refresh button, it calls a Python program to execute and call uh, the most recent data that was saved inside the cloud. So here's a quick video of our system actually working in the field. <clears throat> you can see the web page there, 205 spots, the car coming into the parking lot, tripping the blue LED here, then it should go back to the web page, and you can see now that there are 204 spots available. The car comes back out, trips the red LED, as you can see, you kind of see it. And then you can see that it's back to 205. And then again, the car will come in, trip the blue LED, web page back to 204, and you guys should get the gist from there. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we faced was choosing the correct sensor. Uh, when we initially started, we were using the gym sensor from the previous project. And uh, there was a discrepancy with that sensor. It, it was rated to work from 50 to 16 PSI. I'm sorry, 15 to 60 PSI, but we were getting it to run at about two PSI, which is a problem with it. Uh, so we ended up having to find other sensors later into the project, and uh, a big problem is for most of those sub-miniature low pressure systems, you need to order in packs of 10 at least, mm -hmm. which is a problem because that was around $500 per order, which we didn't have the budget to use. And then uh, another problem was when we had the bounce effect for the new mechanical switches we had, we just uh, figured out a solution with a simple capacitor. So as I was talking about before, the wireless communication was a huge deal. Um, we had to find a product that was scalable so we could go further distances for any size parking lot you wanted. We, when we decided to use the XP, we didn't really know how to use it yet. It's the first time for all of us using it, so that was a big jump for us. Also, we needed to make sure we saved the data in case our website crashed. Uh, we ran into a few problems during the semester where Amazon Web Services, the Apache server would crash and the website would go down temporarily. All we had to do was restart it. But for this, we wanted to make sure we saved all the data on our microcontrollers. So this way, if the website ever went down, we still have the most recent data. So as soon as the website gets back up and running, it's accurate. And then also, creating our own web page was a huge challenge. We've never really worked with HTML code before. And learning how to create our own web page and make it interactive for, some, like, for a user and make it public is a real challenge for us. Uh, and then also the weather. This semester, it rained pretty much almost every day from March to April. Uh, and we really couldn't get outside and do our testing that we needed to do uh, with our sensors and cars because you can't really put a microcontroller out in the rain. Uh, here's a view of our final budget. This is the budget for the parts that were actually implemented in our final project. It ran about $342, not including shipping. Uh, one key thing to mention here is the pressure sensors that we are using were provided by World Magnetic and uh, they were free. We got four free sample switches. Uh, here is our schedule. Uh, for the most of this project, we had to stay on a schedule, and we were we maintained uh, we were pretty reliant on our schedule. We were actually ahead in some parts until when it came to March and April with the rain that prevented us from doing our full scale tests outside. So, what did we learn through this year experience? <clears throat> One of the big things was this is the first time we're not creating a project for fun. We're actually working with a customer. We had to identify the problem. We had to figure out what the customer wanted and we had to build a system for his needs and the needs of the school and all of that. Uh, another learning experience we have is to do a lot more preliminary tests. 
Uh, when we first started out, we had the sensor and we were able to use it and we just kept working on our project that way without actually testing the PSI through the system. And uh, when we found out much later that the PSI generated through the system driving in a parking lot at such a low speed was actually a very small PSI from about half to maybe one and a half PSI. A huge learning experience for us was learning how to use the cloud. Uh, since most companies now are going to a cloud-based platform so they can save all their data without using memory, uh, so for us, this is our real first experience with Amazon Web Services and learning how to use the cloud. Um, we also learned that at the forefront of our projects, we need to do a lot more research before jumping in and trying to build anything. The sensors were a huge deal because we didn't do enough research at the start. So future work for this project, this project's not done and probably won't ever be completely done. One of the things we want to do is add additional sensors to each node that way if we have a third sensor we can even be more accurate we also talked about the idea of adding a different type of sensor some type of rf where we can decide if the car is coming in or out that way there's a redundant idea between two two systems so it's even more accurate that way um, tunable pressure sensors this way you can distinguish between like a bike going over the tubes and an actual car going over the tubes and the big idea for us is to actually implement it in each parking lot rather than just the one that we're doing now. So it would just be duplicating our system over enough to fit the whole school. Here are some of the courses that we found useful during our project. These are the courses that we've taken at Sonoma State. Uh, the big one was microcontroller systems 310. Uh, we use that for the majority of our system with our sensor nodes. Special thanks to Dr. Faramond, Dr. Kajuri. Uh, Cody Smith of Park and Services, and then also Jesse Baker of World Magnetics Company for the free switches. Any questions? Anyone have any questions? I'll start. I, uh, I want to know what the most important thing you learned through the whole process was. The most important? I know the research was the big, yeah. big one at the forefront, actually spending the time figuring out if the actual sensor is the right one rather than just saying like looking at two sensors and like oh this one looks better you know let's use that one we ha we should have done our research more more thoroughly i guess would be what i would say yeah, i would say it. we should have done the psi test come january and figured out if the uh, threshold range of pressure matched what the specs were for the actual equipment we were using yeah, because the calculations we had compared to the actual results differed greatly. So it would be yeah. a lot better if we actually... Field testing is very different than actual just yeah. in the lab. What was your error rate? <clears throat> um, we haven't integrated it into the actual parking lot itself because of security reasons. Uh, someone could just walk away with it. Yeah. And we don't exactly have eight hours to spend during the day to just sit there and watch, <laughs> watch it and it, yeah. go with the stop counter. And then also because of the weather, we didn't have enough time to do data testing because, like we said, with the pressure sensors and the rain, we weren't actually implementing our system until much later. With, with the short testing we did, there wasn't any miscounts or anything like that. I mean, it was also like cars going really slow. It was a pretty like controlled system. So, I mean, we do need to test it more thoroughly is what I'm trying to get at. The one with the bounce or without? Okay, the one before. This one. Okay, so my expectation there is that uh, this is the initial step of the pressure sensor. Yes. yes. And then a car will you know, go through it. It will create something, also whatever. Yeah. And then it should go back to where it starts. It does not show that open here. Is there anything I missed? Um, so, what, what, what this test is, is, uh, no. <clears throat> it's how we blew the tube. No, yeah. it, it, so, what happens is it's, it normally open, right? Normally closed. Normally closed. closed. So, what, the way the system it's is, is before the pressure is met, it's a, it's a low, so it would be low. When uh, we, we yeah. what we were using, we were blowing into the tube to create that pressure threshold, and that created the high that we have. And then when the pressure differential stopped, when it dropped, that's when we had the bounce. So basically when the car, drive o car drives over it, that's when it goes high. And then when the car got off the tube, that's when the bounce would happen. Instead of going directly from high to low, it was bouncing around. So yeah, yeah, if you zoom out a little bit more, then there's... We were just trying to get an accurate picture of that bounce to be able to show it because it happened in microseconds of a time. Yeah. How did you choose the size of the capacitor to get rid of the bounce? 
honestly trial and error at first. <laughs> so um, that's not a very good engineering answer. But um, we actually, talking to Dr. Kajiri, um, we calculated different frequencies too of the actual thing and that, that's a way to go about it. But I mean, we just tried a bunch of different capacitors. Yeah, we had made, a, originally had a filter and we were trying to smooth it out and it wasn't giving exactly what we wanted. And then Dr. Kajuri mentioned maybe putting a capacitor across the switch itself. And then we just took the 10 microfarad capacitor we were using with our filter and we plugged it in and it worked a lot better than what we were doing before. Any other questions? Huh? I was trying to figure out who was coming up next. So we are doing the home energy monitor. My name is Kevin Stuker. This is Nick Soleil, and we had uh, help with Peter Hogue back here. Uh, a lot of thanks to Dr. Saeed Rahimi was our faculty advisor, and David Kaiser was our technical advisor. And thank you to all, all of you for coming. Yeah. So I've uh, you know been coming to school here for a few years, and I've always had a bunch of roommates. A big thing that I would always do is come home at night. There would be nobody home, but every single light in the house was on. Um, I have a cat there, but I don't think he was really concerned with whether or not he needed all the lights. And uh, it was just, you know, a little irking to me to uh, have to come home, especially since I was always dealing with the bills. I'd see this at the end of the month and be like, come on, guys, you know, like, try to turn those off. At least the TV turned that off when no one's there. So uh, a big motivation for this project was to make a system that would give people more of an idea as to what their home is using and put it into a real number, like money, because that obviously speaks around here, and uh, give them an idea to help the, educate them to make smarter decisions within their house and potentially buy more efficient appliances. So for uh, our presentation, we'll talk about some of the products that are already on the market, um, how ours differs, we'll show you how we went about doing it, and a few of the tests we had. So in the process of evaluating different products on the market, we actually went in and installed and tested quite a few of the competitor products out there, Smappy, Nurio, Sense, Chai, Bidgley. Uh, what we found is most of these systems, the way they work is they put CTs in your main electric panels. So these CTs, this is a, a sensor that sits around the wire inside your main service panel. It monitors what the house is consuming by watching all of the current flowing in and out of the house. And uh, the products that are out there on the market, they try to use load disaggregation software. That's a process where software tries to look at the load try, and it tries to see when there's a change in the usage and determine what that load is, whether it's an air conditioner or oven or something. Uh, our, our testing revealed that really a lot of the load disaggregation software that's out there is not that accurate. And part of the reason why is because you're, you know, at my house, the loads are constantly changing every 5, 10, 15 seconds. So you need to have a lot of data you need to be able to kind of do the analysis I think at the device level and you know it helps uh, to be able to sense uh, more 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 circuits than just the main circuit so uh, I thought one of the drawbacks to this system was that uh, to many of the other systems is that it only lets you monitor the main power not the individual loads so for our system um, we have two main components one is the more data acquisition form where we have a system that's going to sit in your breaker panel and like he said you're, we're going to have multiple CTs looking at the conductors that are coming into your house and then that's going to send through Wi-Fi to another module um, that is going to be just receiving all that information 
and display all that data to you um, on a LCD that would be potentially mounted in your wall somewhere. So for our marketing requirements, we are really big on wanting people to see what their home is using at any real time. So power at a, at a given time, as well as energy that they could look up um, over a span of from anywhere from a day to their entire data set. And for the engineering requirements, um, we were really keen on just being as accurate as possible because that's where a lot of the other products today were, were seeming to come short. So we'll spend a little bit talking first about the data logger component of this. So the, the data logger component is actually receiving in the inputs from the CTs. Uh, to do this accurately, we need to take in you know, voltage and uh, current. So what we're trying to do is calculate power, which is what the instantaneous power that a home is using is. And power over time, that's energy. So what you get billed for by the electric company is uh, energy. So to calculate energy accurately, you really need to have a lot of power readings uh, and you need to calculate them you know, frequently and you also need to know both voltage and current. So what we're doing is we're taking in two current input, um, two voltage inputs, one for the uh, 240 volts, you know, there's two lines coming into your house. And then we have CTs there as well as uh, six individual CTs on a branch circuit. So it allows you to monitor you know, your one, you could have one CT maybe on your air conditioner, one CT on your refrigerator, one on your uh, laundry and on your oven. So, you know, our product would allow you to not only monitor the whole house, but actually get very accurate readings for individual loads in the house at the same time. Uh, the way that we're doing this is we're actually looking at a sine wave. Your power coming in is a sine wave, but we, uh, the, the PCU, you know, the processor, it really can only take in instantaneous moments. So what we do is we take uh, about 100 readings per cycle. That's every 60th of a second. So we're taking about 6,000 readings every second, uh, reading that in. We're kind of reconstructing what the waveform looks like for both voltage and current, all that. And then we multiply voltage and current together to get power. This is just the uh, kind of detail of what we're doing at a, an individual op amp. So for voltage, we actually step the voltage through a voltage divider and we drop it down from about 120 volts for each line to about three volts, uh, something that we can put into the uh, microprocessor. And then for the current sensor, what uh, the way that the current sensors work is these CTs, uh, you can put, you know, uh, whatever ampacity you put through them, say 200 amps, you'll get one two thousand two thousandth of that out of this. So it's a very small milliamp current. You can't put a milliamp current into these devices, though. You have to put a voltage in. That's what they read as voltage. So we pass that current across a, a resistor, and there's a voltage drop that occurs across the resistor. And that allows you to uh, take that voltage in, and that's what we're reading, actually, at the microprocessor. And this is a, an image of the board. We've got this actually in the back here. We'd love to have you guys come by and see. It actually, we've got an operational demo. We can turn loads on and off, and you can see the, the power go up and down. Uh, this is, you know, all the 10, uh, C, eight CTs, and come into the top. The voltage on the very top right, there's black and red wire. And then those come in through the op amps into the microprocessor. We also have a real-time clock so that we can calculate power or energy very accurately over the, the day. And this is just doing a test. You can see we, we did this for both all the individual currents and ampacities. So, you know, you can see the probes. We're testing voltage coming in, and then we're confirming that the voltage. So as we built it up, we started off just looking at voltage. Then we looked at current, make sure that's accurate. And then uh, test calibrated that against power. And in the end, we're actually very accurate. These, these CTs are less than, uh, or, you know, less than, 1% inaccurate, should we say. They're 99% accurate or so. And we're actually seeing very high, about 99% accuracy on the readings. So next we'll look at the other module, which is the Raspberry Pi, which is also located in your house. This is where the user interface would be located. Um, and so we're talking over the Wi-Fi from his module to mine. Uh, we had to use a protocol called TCP. And to initiate that, there's something called a three-way handshake, which is demonstrated on the left here. And when the two devices start up, they communicate with each other and sync up and then establish this connection, and then they're able to start passing data. So on the right, we have um, 
the two types of packets we're sending. One is going to be power and the other one is going to be energy. And we just have a packet ID so when I'm receiving this information I can dete uh, detect which packet it is and then sort it into the correct CSV file that's corresponding to that. Here's a layout of what it consists of. So it's just a 5 inch LCD, the power supply, which supplies 2 amps on one port and 1 amp on the other, which each of the the Pi needs 2 amps and the LCD needs 1 amp, so that works out pretty well. And then HDMI cable from the Pi to the LCD and then just a micro SD card for memory. This is an actual picture of the GUI itself. So it's displaying right now uh, total energy. You can see the range on the left hand side uh, just showing a 24 hour period. You can actually select uh, anywhere again from 24 hours to the entire data set and it shows you how much energy each of the CTs have used as well as how much that has cost you over that period of time. We also are showing, um, this one is showing a 24 hour period of just one specific measurement. Uh, you can see it says total on the left so this is just the combined consumption of your entire home. We also have one where you can see the proportions. So if you're not as much interested in how much those are using, but what are each of them using in relationship to each other, you can see the breakdown of that over, again, a date range. And then we also have power readouts. So this is going to be updating um, every four seconds because we're getting uh, Wi-Fi data, again, every four seconds. And this will show you how much each of your CTs are costing you um, every hour, which is a pretty relevant stat, I think. Here's our schedule. For the most part, we were about on time, a little bit behind on some points, but we were able to make it through to the end. Budget was about $404. Uh, that was before taxes and shipping. Mm -hmm. And challenges. One of the big things was the communications. So we um, initially, we tried to get them to communicate with a more basic protocol, but it wasn't really very reliable. That's why we went to TCP, because it's known for being a more reliable protocol over uh, Wi-Fi communication. And uh, once we switched to that one, we were really able to maintain a connection and send data reliably. Um, mm -hmm. We also wanted to uh, put this all on a dev board and kind of productize this a little bit more, get it a little bit more um, you know, consumer ready than, than it was. but. Uh, you know, frankly, that it was a complicated circuit and we were happy keeping it where it was. It's, it took long enough just configuring it on, uh, on the breadboard back there. So that's definitely part of our future work. We'd also like to incorporate the load disaggregation. Um, the reason why it's so inaccurate on, uh, for if you just have the two CTs on the mains, there's so many other individual circuits that are going on in your house that it's a lot more difficult to differentiate each of those individual loads. So once you break down those loads into maybe five or six like we have, it's a lot easier to recognize those loads if there's only a couple on each of the CTs to differentiate between the two. And we'd also like to eventually develop a phone app. Um, right now, the only way you can access the data is through that wall-mounted LCD, but we would like to establish the Raspberry Pi as a server so that if you're not at home, you can still have the option of looking up all the information that you'd like. One thing that I think makes a lot of sense, too, is being able to kind of remotely control loads, because uh, one of the most common applications for this would be, you know, for solar arrays. A lot of people will put these systems in. If you have revenue grade accuracy, you can do your billing for your solar systems uh, on these systems, also looking at the consumption. And then to be able to see, you know, how much is the solar consuming. In places like Hawaii, they're not allowed to export power to the grid uh, from the solar arrays. So if you could monitor the site and you say, hey, the solar is producing more than the house is consuming, you could potentially trigger then to turn on a water heater or turn off your solar uh, to, to prevent back feeding to the grid. So there's, there's a lot of uh, applications for uh, remote load control. Here's our supporting courses. Um, definitely use a little bit of each of those. A lot of help around, the, around each references. And any comments, questions? Yeah. Now how I, how I could define your measurements when it comes to the accuracy of Yeah, sure. Yeah, so that's actually something we didn't get into. I was thinking about that in the shower this morning. Like, what would we, what would it take to kind of start doing reactive power, right? Because, I mean, that that is something you could do kind of as a next step, which is, uh, you know, right now we're, we basically know when the peaks are occurring. We're, we're in process, you know, we're getting enough points along each sine wave 
that we, we could basically uh, start looking at it and, and put using the real-time clock potentially to trigger where the peaks are occurring and then using that to, uh, to correlate power factor. Currently, we're not looking at, and what we're discussing here is are the, are the voltage and current in sync or are they slightly out of sync with each other? And if they're, if they're in sync, you have 100% pure, like 1.0 pure power factor. Uh, when they're out of sync, that's when you start to have reactive power. And uh, being able to calculate reactive power is kind of a, a more sophisticated uh, step, but certainly uh, we, I think we've got the infrastructure and architecture to kind of start uh, to do that. Just uh, we haven't done that yet. No, I suggest that we put in the future work. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Same question as last team. What was the most important thing you learned through the whole process? Um, I think for me it was when you're planning out to do something, it seems a lot easier than it's actually going to be. <laughs> uh, some of those things I it imagined would only take a certain amount of time ended up lasting a little bit longer. So um, really time management is was a big one. Unless you had more data for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Is it too early to ask you what you think of commercial application of cell phone for a six node system? Um, well, it might be a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, we had to do a little bit extra spending to get a few different parts, but probably like three hundred, four hundred dollars. Yeah, that, I mean, most of the systems are around two or three hundred. Uh, there, there's a product out of Australia that uses a bunch of small, like clamp-on CTs, and does something similar. And I think you know that what we're using here is a pretty high accuracy, <laughs> revenue-grade CT. 1% accurate. Uh, if you were going to do individual loads, you probably wouldn't need such a, you know, a valuable CT. These cost like 10 to $14 each. Uh, luckily, where I work at Enphase, we had a large stock of them, 300 they were throwing out, and I ended up with the box a couple of years ago, so I had a large supply to pick from. Any other questions? Yeah. A couple, couple of points. Um, the first one there is uh, you know, talking about what we don't currently see. They are always in sync. Yeah. What is different in the two is the phase lead or lag between the voltage yeah. and current that decides on the reactive part of the of the pole. So sync is not the issue. The okay. phase angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, phase angle. Okay. Uh, regarding the commercial part of it, I was thinking about actually an application that's already in the market and could uh, Basically, mimic that application. You are you are sampling the waveform. Uh, let's say voltage is there, and once you are sampling it and processing it in a micro processor, you could easily use a fast Fourier transform to find the second and third and whatever harmonics mm -hmm. of that voltage. Mm -hmm. This is not very critical for home applications, but it is extremely critical for big plants. And there are equipment in the market to tell you mm -hmm. how much harmonics are generated, typically from large motors. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There are some magnetizations process in the saturation in the motors that generate strong harmonics, which will overheat transformers and power lines. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for the plant to know what it is. Get it done. So yeah. that's very good uh, commercial application already in the market. You can mimic it at very low cost by adding a little bit of extra processing. Thank you. Dr. Cassis, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends where you locate it. Um, one thing is if, if we got the size down enough where you could just locate it inside the main service panel, it, it's communicating Wi-Fi with, uh, with the home hallway monitor. So uh, it, what you typically see with a lot of these is that uh, they get installed as a revenue grade meter with the solar array. And so if somebody's in, already out there installing the solar, got equipment on site and maybe it's the addition you're you already have to put some monitor in so if you put this in as your revenue grade monitor you know the incremental addition wouldn't be very much 
uh, adding, especially if these are split core CTs, which are available, you know, you, there's CTs that you just open them up, close them around a wire, and you don't have to disconnect the wire and pass it through. Um, that, that would make it faster. And I, like I said, I think if we were gonna really productize this, the individual loads, it would all be split core CTs, not solid core. Thank y'all. Hello, my name is Arturo Arcos. This is David House. We have David Story and Jeremy Shawley. And we worked on the dynamic solar power system for a small satellite called EdgeCube. Um, here's a quick overview of what we plan to cover today. So there are multiple types of small satellites. Well, we're working on something uh, called a CubeSat. So its typical dimensions are 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters cubed. And the mass of it is about 1.3 kilograms, typically. And they're made normally from uh, off-the-shelf components, so cots. So this uh, small satellite monitors something called the red edge. And that refers to a region of rapid change and reflectance of uh, vegetation in the near infrared range of the spectrum. The geography team is uh, analyzing 13 10 nanometer wavelengths within what is known as the red edge from three years of multi-sensorial imagery from California to help develop the sensors and help select the filters for this project. So this is the satellite's payload. So EdgeCube uses non-imaging sensors to monitor the red edge in large regions of the Earth by uh, multiple narrow spectral bands in the wavelengths that range from 630 nanometers to 800. And we're going to use red, green, and blue for calibration. The satellite will monitor the whole planet as it orbits. And after multiple orbits, we'll be able to map the whole planet. Uh, as far as we know, no one has ever done this or monitored the red edge of the whole planet. Um, so our focus uh, was uh, focused on the power system. So most CubeSats use a microcontroller and lithium ion batteries in their power system. Uh, our client said that microcontrollers are risky to have in a power system because who's gonna check the power going into that computer and so on and you'd <coughs> So what we decided to do is make a safer circuit, but maintain that efficiency. So here are the actual requirements. Uh, we needed over 75% efficiency. We needed to be able to track the status of the batteries and the solar panels uh, so that we can see over time what decays first so the next CubeSat could last longer. Um, it needed fail-safe features in case there wasn't enough power, we could turn off the microcontroller and save the program. And uh, the, the circuit needed to be simple because uh, complex circuits are risky and are prone to failure. Um, our circuit needed to use less than 10% of the power that we collect, or there would be no point in having our circuit. And it needed to be functional between minus 20 degrees Celsius and 120 degrees Celsius. So this is a, a table of our process. Uh, we first started out figuring out the problems with the microcontroller process. So we found that it's prone to radiation, there's, it uses a lot of power, and um, it's unreliable for those reasons. We decided to switch to a clock-based circuit, but as we continue to try to develop a clock-based solution, uh, we found that 
it was it was getting too too complex to fit on one of the boards that we were designing. So we had to switch to our final version, which was the current base model. The current base model actually changes frequency as different power levels come in. So it it adjusts to the power level and can support all angles of the solar panel. So a little bit more in depth on our solution. Uh, it does not use a microcontroller. It only uses eight components per panel. And uh, it just funnels power through a set of capacitors and switches it through. So it converts the higher voltage of the solar panel to more current into the battery. So here we have a couple of the iterations of our uh, solar power system that we went through. Um, on the left is the battery monitor board, and on the right is the power system board. Um, so we, our, our initial circuit was built on a, on a breadboard. Um, so our, our first iteration was to, uh, our, the, our purpose was to see how smaller, more efficient parts would affect our circuit. Um, and, and we saw positive results from, uh, from, from doing so. Uh, our second board, um, our client asked if we could uh, add the capability to use uh, or, or t to accompany six solar panels instead of the three that we'll be using on the CubeSat project. Um, and we were able to do that in that second iteration. And on our third and final iteration, iteration we added a ground plane which allows us to uh, better um, uh, manage the heat that can build up. <clears throat> on these uh, on these circuit boards in the vacuum of space, since there's no airflow to uh, help dissipate heat. Um, and here we have uh, our temperature testing setups. Um, on the left, we have uh, an oven that we use to pump the temperature up to around 120 degrees Celsius. Uh, we tested our board before and after a 30-minute test in this environment and we got positive results, um, no error in function. Uh, we also tested our circuit under uh, cold conditions, so around minus 40 degrees Celsius. We used some dry ice to attain that temperature. Um, and we ran the board for five hours uh, with no issue under that uh, cold temperature. And uh, as we mentioned before, our, our goal of temperature range was 120 degrees Celsius to minus 20. And uh, we very positively reached that goal, uh, proven by proven by this test. And here we have uh, a picture of our re reliability test setup. Uh, this is what we call the the flat sat. Um, we set up you know this rat's nest of wires and our circuit boards and pa and solar panels on a cake turner and set it up next to a very high intensity light to kind of simulate. Uh, what might happen in orbit. So our satellite will be rotating and we determined um, over the course of about three months uh, we ran this test that our circuit would hold up to these conditions and supply power to the system adequately. And uh, from our efficiency testing we have extrapolated some data. Um, we figured that when our battery is at 3.7 volts we are able to attain 85 percent, uh, 85.46 percent efficiency um, from our solar panels uh, when the light is perpendicular to our solar panels. Um, and as we said before, our goal was around 75 percent. Um, furthermore, our circuit only uses about uh, 1.48 percent of the power that we get uh, from the solar panels, uh, exceeding our goal of 10 percent. And uh, we also created a GUI to help students and whoever works on this satellite in the future uh, to help them visualize the data. Um, the GUI produces current voltage and power plots. And these plots can be saved um, and, and used however the user pleases. Um, and it was created with Python and a additional um, uh, Python library called Matplot. Um, and that kind of goes in line with our open source uh, goal of our project. Um, so I'm David. I'm a freshman to help work with them on their, on their senior design project. 
Uh, so last week we actually went to Cal Poly to go to the CubeSat Developers Workshop, which basically is where um, groups and universities come to present their CubeSats. So what we really found is that this um, that our CubeSat is is really innovative. A lot of other universities were interested in using our products. There's a lot of opportunity for uh, jobs in engineering and uh, for people in electrical and aerospace and the private sector, as well as um, there's a lot of further collaborations that can be done with Sonoma State. We found a lot of people, uh, specifically groups from Moorhead State and Kentucky and at UCLA wanted to help track our satellite in the future, which we found to be very interesting. So part of my work on uh, EdgeCube is I went away from the power system. I helped do some uh, testing on power system, but mainly did a sensor chopper for the IR system. So it's basically a simple servo that just covered a white plane over the sensors. And that basically allowed us to track, or will, will allow us to track the, um, or measure, when we measure the IR light coming back from the leaves, we can see if we're looking at a cloud or something, just as kind of a base test. And then my main work has been on N-slit, which is a, a cutout of an end that goes over a light sensor, which uh, when the satellite's spinning in orbit, we can take light pulses, get a ratio, and that will allow us to find a, the angle between the spin axis of the satellite and the sun, which will help with the in-orbit positioning. So going back to our requirements, uh, we achieved 85.46 efficiency at average power level of the battery. Uh, we completed our board to track the battery voltages and power in and out as well as uh, we added an extra switch as a fail-safe feature in case our circuit does happen to fail, which it's been three months and it still hasn't failed, so. Uh, our circuit does turn off the power at 3.3 volts and below, and uh, it's only eight components per panel, so it's not a very complex circuit. <clears throat> I'd like to acknowledge uh, the EdgeCube team Here's the Sonoma State team uh, in blue. In red, uh, Santa Clara University is helping us with ground stations. Uh, Moog helped us 3D print our aluminum case. Uh, we have the model over at our table in plastic if you'd like to see it after the presentations. Uh, at Moorhead State, we have a student working on particle detector. And there's a list of our advisors in the red. Uh, EdgeCube has a delivery date of next February, 2018. Uh, we have a preliminary design review in June, and the system will be tested in the next few months on a tethered balloon as well as a chased balloon. So future work, since we did complete the power system, uh, we're switching on to other projects. So I will be working on infrared sensor analysis, interfacing new sensors, as well as flight code and soldering the surface mount components on the boards. I'm going to be uh, designing some more PCBs that need to be made for the uh, satellite, uh, possibly work on the gyroscope, and uh, now that we have a 3D model of the, uh, the satellite, I can interface their sensors on it a little bit more flush, so some 3D design, as long as help uh, debug some of the hardware. And I will continue work on the sun sensor as well as implementing a, um, using the same sun sensor to see the, the angle from the moon, which will allow us to do more accurate positioning as well as uh, possible work on torque coils, which will allow us to control the spin rate in, the, in orbit. Questions? Uh, we're going to be doing about 100 kilometers, so a lot larger. Okay, no, that, that's interesting. Um, and then one other question is, you guys say you've been testing uh, the system for three months next to a lamp? Yes. How many solar cycles have you simulated for three months? Is it one a day or 50 a day? Or? Uh, the orbit that is going to be going on is, we're, since we're in LEO orbit, low Earth orbit, uh, it'll take about an hour and a half for our satellite to go around so about 15 times a day for 90 days okay. um, so yes okay. professor decker uh, 
the geography department has a spectral, uh, they have plain data from a hyperspectral camera. So they've been measuring the red edge across all of California and they've been getting pretty good results on the vegetation across California. So we're gonna keep continue with our sensor and just use the, the narrow bands that they decide are the best for getting that red edge. Will clouds block the visibility? Uh, yes, clouds will block it, but since we have red, green, and blue uh, filters, we'll be able to tell when we're looking at clouds because all of those will be high because we'll get white. And we can filter out that data. What's the um, maximum spin rate? So uh, since we have torque coils and we're going to try to get a gyroscope on there, we're going to try to get our spin rate to about once every 10 seconds. And uh, we'll probably spend a little time using the torque coils to get that spin rate. You know what my question is? <laughs> what, is what was yeah. our greatest challenge? What, did we learn? <laughs> what was the most important thing you learned through the whole process? Go ahead. I'll go next. So um, what I learned was uh, there's a since when we talked to multiple people at the conference last week, we found that a lot of them use microcontrollers and uh, lithium ion batteries, and the thought of changing that was so crazy to them that they wouldn't have even tried to do that. So it was pretty cool seeing that not going the same way other people go it can also be useful and works really well in just designing things. Uh, one of the greatest things, I guess, that we learned is uh, just because we've been working with a lot of different people, uh, just, for example, getting PCBs. You know, we order them, expect them to arrive, and they don't, you know? So something like that is, is pretty great. Yeah, I would, uh, if I were to add anything, it would be that uh, communication is key, especially working with uh, a group as large as, as the one that you guys saw. Um, Having everyone be on the same page is definitely a huge part of a project like this. Yeah, and, uh, another thing I added is that simplicity is key. You don't need something super complicated. Mm -hmm. um, for example, my N-slit, there's companies selling the same thing for five grand at the Cal Poly conference when we can build it for thirty dollars. So. Would that was it cost thirty dollars? About for the N sensor, yeah. <laughs> the, the only thing that we're really concerned about is there is a band in low earth orbit that does have higher radiation, but since we are, since one of our uh, members is working on a part particle detector, he will be able to shut off our power uh, the power to the system, saving the microcontrollers if we do get into that region. <laughs> uh, I have one semester, so I will be around uh, helping David and other students uh, develop the project, and I'll probably volunteer after I graduate as well. Yeah, I really like the project, so I'm going to volunteer and kind of help out any way I can. Uh, I'm graduating as well, I, but I'm, I'm not quite too sure what my future holds in the, in the project. Thank you. So we're the Kinect Motion Mapper team, and the interns are Andrew Baldwin, Gary Negan, and myself, Edson Hernandez. 
So the problem we were trying to deal with is that uh, as cameras are getting more advanced and being implemented in more places, uh, particularly stores, a lot of them aren't being used to their full potential. Uh, many stores have probably about like four or five, or if it's a big store, you know, hundreds of cameras all set up mostly for theft deterrent. But we believe that these cameras can be used for um, more and gather data. So our proposed implementation is um, we want to take a Connect camera, which is currently used for an Xbox 360, and it can gather uh, depth and RGB, RGB data. And we can transfer that data to a computer for processing. And then on that computer, we can process that data and display it in maps that can show the most popular areas in the store and density and actually count the number of people who are going in and out of the store. Our system works by placing the device in a, the area of view and it'll continuously capture RGB and depth images and store them on the Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, that data will be uh, posted on an FTP server and transmitted through the network via Ethernet or Wi-Fi and it will be received by a PC running MATLAB, which does all of our image processing. And the output of our program will show various, uh, various maps that show the data of the movement of people in that area. So this is basically how it looks. We have the Kinex connected right to a USB to a Raspberry Pi. <clears throat> and then from the PC, we're using MATLAB to run and uh, analyze the data. So this is what our in user interface looks like. It opens up with a shot of the area to be mapped. And the user can select the time range of the data that they'd like to see. And there are buttons for our three main functions, which include a floor map, which is a projection of the traffic onto the floor plane, a 3D heat map, which shows the traffic in 3D, including the height, and the object tracking routine, which counts the number of people that were in the area and plots it versus time. We have some smaller options that um, like to save the output as an image file or change the IP of the Raspberry Pi and also download new data since it's continuously capturing. So the first plot that we did is a uh, floor map plot. So what this basically is, is when the camera is going out and getting depth data, it'll compare the images, get the depth value of anything that has moved, and then it can plot that in a position in a 2D plane it essentially is oriented on the, um, the floor axis. And um, what it can do is it'll, it'll show that the hotter the area is, it means there is more movement in that direction. And as you can kind of see, as it gets lighter and lighter blue, it just means that there's less and less movement, with the dark blue being that there was probably no movement in that area at all. Uh, this is our 3D heat map, and it's a scatter plot, a rotatable plot where the size of the circles and the colors show indicate the more traffic in that area. Um, it starts out similarly to our floor map. Uh, it, it compares the images and filters them and gets the positions of movement, and then it bins those points in 3D space, and then it uses the histogram data to change the size of the circles. So in order to tell, to tell the computer what's an object and what's a moving object, we're gonna grab two RGB images, we're gonna compare them, and we're gonna get a bunch of ones and zeros. Zeros is gonna be the background, and ones are gonna be the, the movement between two images. So that's the first part. For the second part, we're gonna tell the computer, hey, so this matrix is basically an object. And the third part is used tracing the, the, the objects. So we're gonna use a Calma filter. The Calma filter will trace the objects even though if they overlap, it will still follow the the object and it will, will still count it. So some of the marketing and engineering requirements we talk about at the beginning of the semester, we wanted the, the program to be able to detect at least five objects slash people and also get an accuracy of at least 70%. One of our engineering requirements is to maintain a frame error rate under 5%. Uh, bad images gives us bad accuracy on our output. And another one of our requirements is to plot, to generate a plot in under three minutes per hour of data. We surveyed some people to get an idea of how long they're willing to wait. And it's a lot of, uh, a lot of data and a lot of processing. So to test one of the engineering requirements, which is the accuracy, I went to different frames and got this pie chart over here. So 50% um, of the time, we have an accuracy of 100%. 72, 27% um, of the time we're an accuracy of 72%, and um, 
for 18%, we have an accuracy of 67%. So that gives us an average of 80%, which is actually better than the 70% of accuracy that we were talking about. And for the number of objects, I try to look for the frame that have about five people. So as we can see, in some cases, there's a little bit of overlap. So instead of detecting one person, it's gonna, um, the, 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 the program is gonna detect, um, actually use one, one object, or for example, in this region right here, uh, which is, there's only one person, but the program detect, detected um, two objects. But it still did a pretty good job detecting five people, as we can see. So we tested the runtime of our program, each of our routines separately, and various sets of data. Um, all three were able to meet the requirement of three minutes per hour of data, and they all ran about the same amount of time for each one. The next test we ran was to um, measure the amount of bad frames or dropped frames, and the top, the image on the top left is the is a depth image where the level of gray shows how far the object is from the camera, and the bad frame on the bottom shows the distorted image where the the depth data is not consistent and the position is messed up. So we we ran a sample, we ran a few samples, and um, originally when we were using the Raspberry Pi three, we were getting a lot of dropped frames. Uh, we were getting a frame error rate of about 46%, which means that the camera is really only recording half the time. So we, after yeah. investigating that issue, we switched over to the Raspberry Pi 2, and with that we were able to get about 1.2% error. So a major um, problem with the image filtering is trying to figure out you know, how much to filter the image. Um, and so as you can see on the top here, we have basically the unfiltered image after we subtracted the two and it's showing all the movement and there's a lot of noise. So what we used is an averaging filter and what the filter does is it basically um, takes a certain size and that's what the N is. It's the number of pixels in a square and it's saying um, for all the pixels in that area, find the average of them and set all the pixels in that square to the same number. So by doing that, we can increase the average to kind of eliminate some of the noise and it helps us filter down as you can see there's a lot of noise and then we get down to two objects and we can use that to get the depth position but another problem would be over filtering and sometimes if you filter too much two objects that are far away might become one or um, be eliminated entirely if it's too small um, yeah. so this is our schedule um, we kept fairly close to it. Um, we started way back in October and we've been starting with just documentation and getting everything ready and about in January is when we started executing the, the, um, the program and all the functions and implementing everything together. Um, we honestly stuck pretty close to the schedule. We actually had a few switches with uh, me and Edson actually switching and using um, going on each other's codes, him working with the object detection and me working with the floor map instead. But overall it, was, it, it came out pretty much the way we wanted. So we were planning to spend around three hundred dollars for the for the unit. We only bought the Kinect, Raspberry Pi, SD card, power supplies, and we still uh, stay be below what the client was expecting to to spend on the on the unit. So we're gonna be running the demo after this presentation, so you guys can come check it out. But we're gonna we're gonna give you guys a, a little bit of the overview of how the program works. So for this particular example. We can select different different times, different dates. We are only running half an hour. This is an actual image of the program running. We're gonna set a um, a reference. So we, we what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare different images with that reference frame. And then uh, we have the IP section, so we can manually input the IP of the Raspberry Pi, and from there we can get the data. So the first part is getting the 3D map. As we can see, um, there's a lot of congestion in this zone. This is only 30 minutes. So that means that there's, there was a lot of transactions probably made at this point. Through, through, through time, with more data, you, you, can, you can see different regions, for example, different products being more, more popular with time. The second part is getting the floor map. So the floor map is going to tell us how people are walking in the store. So as we can see, this area is being more transited than, for example, these in these areas. And the last part is the object tracking part. The object tracking part is going to give us a nice plot. The plot is going to tell us how many people were at the store at different times. 
So we had a lot of challenges when we were uh, working with this, and um, one of the first main ones was choosing between uh, what software to use to run the program, MATLAB or OpenCV. And while OpenCV uh, provided a lot of additional stuff and it would be free, um, MATLAB actually had all of the filters and everything we needed and the drivers to help run the connect. Um, another key thing was trying to, what we would use to distinguish between two objects. And um, so that was definitely a big challenge in trying to how to filter that out, um, as we talked about earlier, to make sure that we're actually getting something that's moving and not maybe, you know, a light flickering or just, you know, a door opening or closing. Uh, with the interfacing the Raspberry Pi to the Connect, we were working with unstable device drivers, which have limited support in terms of documentation. And so that was one of the reasons why we had issues with the Raspberry Pi 3. And then another challenge that we have is um, working with large data sets. We would like to increase the, the capture rate of the device so that we can have more accurate data, but that would mean uh, increasing the amount of data we have and working with it. So we've learned to be organized with our data and make a reliable, efficient system. For future work, you probably want to try uh, using different algorithms. Um, there's still some error in our uh, in our in our data. Probably improve the accuracy of the program, and of course the speed of the program. So for every 30 minutes of data that we we, we get, the program takes about three minutes. So for if the user wanna wanna analyze, for example, six hours, it's gonna take around 30 minutes to 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 get the the plots. This is just some of our supporting courses. Um, something that was really key was our MATLAB course and actually our uh, digital signal processing course because that allowed us to learn a lot about filters and different kinds of image processing. But simple things even like our networking class to get the FTP servers set up and get all the devices interfaced with each other were incredibly helpful. We'd like to thank our advisor, Dr. Brendan Hamelbizzle, for all his help on this project. He helped us out tremendously and the source award funding for helping us obtain all the items we needed and the Department of Engineering Science. Any questions or comments? Yes. Uh, what do you suggest to uh, basically uh, do the filtering objectively? Like what's the best filter potentially? Well, not the best filter, but then how should you do this objectively? Uh, the filtering objectively, I mean, in other words, for the other tracking stuff. Wait a second, just for the image filtering. Oh. Well, fortunately, we're doing a lot in MATLAB, and it's a very powerful tool. And we can, and there's a lot of available options for us to use. Um, we have to balance uh, the speed of our program with the accuracy, <laughs> and so. Uh, we chose certain filters that would try that. We would like to have more time to try different filtering uh, methods. But we pretty much had to kind of invent our own filters, not really from scratch, but just kind of code our own as opposed to going online and just saying, hey, this, this filter is really good, or different companies that do filters that can run on the computer. But we had to kind of come up with our own that what can we do with the time that we have and with the images that we have to make it work the way we want. Yeah. Have you shown this to your client, and how well does it fit his or her requirements or what he's looking for? Okay, so there's a lot of things we can do with the data, but one of the uh, requirements that we needed from the client was just to be able to just show him how, how many people were, for example, at certain times. But you can still do a lot more work with that, so it just depends on the, on the client. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. How far does the, does the object have to be in front of the camera in order to get reliable results? Um, unfortunately, we're limited by the Kinect, which is why we would like to try other depth sensors. Um, so as you know, the Kinect is designed for a living room space. Um, so we are limited by those uh, by the range of the Kinect. Up close, it, up close to the camera, um, it, it blocks a lot of the other stuff, of the other movement. So we try to remove that data from our from our plots in order to to keep maintain accuracy and um, further out of the range it goes up to 15 feet yes 
And for my question, what is, what's the most important thing you learned out of the whole program? The most important thing we learned was to document our code so that our other teammates can understand and for future work people would be able to understand it. And that's a, um, the, our entire project was software based and so that was a really big part of it. I'm also doing a lot of research. I learn all, a lot about image processing and there's not only um, using binary um, subtraction to get, for example, objects. There's a lot of algorithms to do, uh, to track objects, for example. Was that used in the audio? Yeah, was yeah. that used, yeah. that used for yours? Yes, yeah, so we still, uh, so in the in this line. Sorry. So what the computer is going to see, uh, each a bunch of ones and zeros, uh, what we're going to do is just get these matrices, and we're going we to get the centroid of this, uh, these objects, basically. So yeah. Uh, no, we we kept an eye on the our requirements, including the CPU use and the um, power consumption, to make sure that we didn't with switching over to the Raspberry Pi, we didn't um, intrude on the other requirements um, while watching our capture rate to make sure that we were getting reliable data. Anything else? Oh, final question. Yeah. Uh, Cost of MATLAB be an issue uh, for your uh, cost? It's actually something we put in our in our thing, but yeah, they would have to purchase MATLAB in addition to actually it was two or, or two one toolboxes. two toolboxes that uh, would be needed for the image processing and the object detection. Mm -hmm. So that we factored that into our cost, but yeah, it would be something. But honestly, it was actually the most expensive part probably of our project. So including all of that, we were able to keep it under three hundred dollars. So. Any other questions? Thank you. Yes. Just to follow up with that comment, um, you can actually with MATLAB do compile and make it ask it right to you. Right? So if I want to run your code, for example, I don't necessarily want that to you compile it for me and send me the That would be a be a great expansion to our project. Yeah, it would. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Aaron Marquez, uh, this is Jaime Siriaco, and this is Michael Dunn, and we're the Athena Project. Uh, we, our advisor is Dr. Fareed Fairman, and our client is Arthur Abuchewicz. And so this is an overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to go over up the problem, our solution, our engineering and marketing requirements, uh, some diagrams explaining our, how our system works, uh, the challenges we encountered, our schedule, and what we learned from doing this project. So uh, epilepsy is one of the most common disorders in the world. It's a neurological disorder in which the nerve cell activity in the brain is disturbed and causes seizures. An estimated 65 million people around the world have epilepsy, and one in 21 Americans will uh, develop epilepsy at some point in their life. And uh, it can be especially dangerous for people uh, living with epilepsy who live alone, because they can uh, having a seizure can leave them incapacitated or unconscious for uh, several hours 
and it could be dangerous if there's uh, appliances are left on, such as a stove. And we got this idea from our client, Arthur, who last semester came to our scene design class and was looking for an engineering team to uh, build a device for his wife who has epilepsy, uh, one that can uh, do the things that we described as, uh, such as turning off the appliances and detecting seizures. And so that's what we set out to do. Uh, but before we did, we looked at what uh, devices currently existed. The devices that we found uh, that monitors seizures and detects seizures is a uh, SAMI alert. The SAMI alert is a camera that monitors a patient throughout the day or night, but they don't notify a family member or caregiver. On the other hand, Empatica and Smart Monitor, they use their own algorithm to detect seizures and they do notify a family member or caregiver. And you may ask yourself, how's our device different? Well, our device is different because we use a simple user interface with a dedicated radio link uh, you don't have to be tech savvy. It has two simple buttons, uh, a panic and a reset. And uh, we use our own algorithm to detect tonic clonic seizures. And when an event occurs, it logs the data on the website in real time and notifies a family member or caregiver through a, a text message and email. And the key thing is if, if our, client, our client's wife is cooking or using any power tools, it'll automatically turn off all the electrical appliances in the home. So here's our marketing requirements. A couple that we'll be going through are the ones here in uh, yellow. Um, so we decided to make the bracelet uh, in the form of, of a bracelet for the seizure detection device because the um, most of the shaking could be detected easily there. Um, and so we needed to accurately uh, detect the seizure as well as we needed to um, have a panic and an OK button so they could, if they weren't having a seizure, they could push the panic button or if there was a false alarm or they recovered, they can press the OK button. And each of those events would send the uh, text message to the caregiver. Um, and also a primary thing is that uh, the system should cost less than $300 per unit. And here are our engineering requirements. One of the major things is that the unit must last for the whole day. So, uh, so we spent a good amount of time uh, testing the, the life that we would uh, last a whole 16 hours um, and also we had to manage the um, the amount of power that the that the device um, uses so it could go into a uh, sleep mode if it's not um, when it when it's not needed um, and the uh, the monitoring station needs to have a robust uh, wireless link um, because uh, you know our, our client Arthur he his wife is at home cooking often, and, and she's, he's really concerned about her having a seizure while she's cooking. So the, the wireless link is a important part of that. Um, and also, uh, we decided um, to focus only on the 110 volt uh, circuits for a stove, because there, there could be gas or uh, electric, but we decided to focus primarily on the seizure detection so here's a di one diagram of our system. We have the wearable, which uh, the person with epilepsy would wear on their wrist. And then we have our central gateway module, uh, which is a Raspberry Pi 3, and that handles sending text and email, and also uploading data to the cloud. And then we have our appliance controller, which handles uh, turning on and off the appliances, and all three communicate with each other uh, video, uh, via uh, radio link. And so here's a slightly more in-depth uh, diagram. Inside our wearable module, we're using an accelerometer and gyroscope sensor and a uh, ARM Cortex M0 microcontroller and two uh, buttons. One's a panic and one's an OK button and a battery charging circuitry. So we're uh, powering it with a LiPo battery. And then in our central gateway module, we're using a Raspberry Pi 3 and it has a micro SD card and it's connected to the internet to communicate with the cloud. And then our appliance controller module, we have another uh, a microcontroller with a RF transceiver and uh, uh, some relays to control the turning, shutting on and off appliances. So not to bore you with another bill of materials here, but um, the main point here is that we succeeded meeting our budget and we're actually building three units and uh, two of those will have actual clients. So here's um, an example of our printed circuit boards. 
Uh, originally, we made the first wearable circuit board a little too big, so this is actually uh, the one in the middle is the um, the second board that we made, and we we shrunk it down. Um, and also, we have a the central module uh, circuit board that we've developed. And so here's a picture of our wearable. We have the new circuit board on the left, and then we have our accelerometer in the middle. Underneath it is a, a piezo buzzer, and then we have two our two physical buttons with which have uh, LEDs inside. And then on the back is our microcontroller, and we're housing it. And so we designed and 3D printed a casing uh, to house the electronics, and then we attached a watch band so it can be easily worn on the wrist. And then uh, the the buzzer is used for to give audio feedback when certain events occur, such as when a seizure occurs, or but when the buttons is pressed or the battery is low, uh, or if it goes out of range of the central module. Uh, and they for each of these events, it gives a different tone, so you can tell the difference between them. And so inside our microcontroller, we have our seizure detection algorithm working, and how that works is we're reading raw data from the accelerometer, the X Y Z from the X Y Z axis and we're calculating the root mean squared. So we get just one number, and then we store that in the variable, and then we do another read, uh, calculate another RMS. So we're comparing the difference, we're calculating the difference between our, our current RMS value and our previous RMS value. And if that's greater than some threshold that we set, then we increment the counter. And then we do that over and over again, and if that counter gets exceeds its own threshold, then we s that's a seizure, and the alarm goes off and the text is sent. And we also have a timeout function built in, so if the counter increments some, but it doesn't surpass the threshold and there's no activity for a certain amount of time, then the counters will be reset. So that the way that the central module works, we first connected the Raspberry Pi to AWS IoT, and then Amazon Web Services has other services, and once we connected those services to the Internet of Things, uh, and, we, and we ran our algorithm script, uh, and then once that's running and an event occurs, the raw data is held in DynamoDB, and that triggers uh, Amazon Lambda to execute a script and push that raw data to MySQL database, which is on Amazon EC2, and then displays it on Django. And at all at the same time, it's sending out through Amazon SNS a text message and an email notification. And as you can see, these are the results the two emails and uh, a text message. We took a marketing standpoint by if, if we want to uh, give a, a customer our system, they can come to our website and this is the, the home page and they can sign up and log in and once they're logged in uh, on the right, you could see that you could add a serial number that each product will have and you could add a little bio of the client or in a picture. And then once the system is set up, uh, in, your pro in the customer, they can go to their customer account and they will be able to see three graphs. The first one is the customer status. This is important because if a doctor comes and see this, uh, they can see the different statuses that the patient uh, has throughout the day. And the data that is stored uh, is the last 48 hours. But if the doctor wants to see since the day that the the system was connected to present day, they could download a CSV file and see all the data. We stored the accelerometer data because the doctor could see if how, how, uh, how violent a seizure was versus one that wasn't. The compass came along with the board and we're planning on the, in the future to use it more efficiently. The gyroscope, we used it in our early stages of making or creating our algorithm and our table that the customer will see is just the rep, uh, representation of the of all the graphs. So, <clears throat> so you can see here's an example of our our breadboard of the uh, appliance controller with the uh, relay that's supplied by the customer. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the custom data control packets here. So we we basically invented our own packet structure to control the devices. For example. The wearable device, its main goal is to always transmit its signal. And the central module, its main goal is to always uh, receive the signal. And But once it receives a signal, it changes it. Then its main goal 
is to notify the caregiver and take the um, uh, and send the, the the text message and turn the stove off. And then the stove, its goal is to always listen for the central module. So there, there was quite a bit of work to do to um, to define these these custom packets and control the timing of, of our own datagram that we invented. So um, the uh, one of the challenges here was the power consumption of the wearable. So we had to um, uh, basically um, choose between the battery size and the life of the the the, uh, the microcontroller here. Um, so we originally had a larger battery that was, that lasted a long time, and because it lasted long enough, we went to a smaller battery. Um, but we did a lot of testing there. Um, as I talked a little bit about the the communications, the radio mo modules, that was a, a challenge to get that all working. And one thing we noticed is that the line of sight uh, transmission is a lot better than in a big steel building like Salazar. Um, and also the size of the, the wearable, like I said, we made two circuit boards. The first one we decided was too big, and so we had to go back to the drawing board and try to shrink that a little bit. Yeah, and another challenge was uh, the accuracy of our seizure detection algorithm, because uh, there are different types of seizures. There's myoclonic, which are short uh, jerks in the upper torso and legs, which last maybe one to two seconds. And then there are also absence seizures, which the person doesn't shake at all. They just kind of blank out and they're still for a few seconds. And so we instead decided to focus on the types of seizures that our client's wife uh, has, which are tonic-clonic seizures, which are characterized by uh, vigorous shaking in the upper torso and the arms. And another challenge was uh, getting the tapping to work as, as buttons. So that's something we said in our proposal was that we would try to get uh, the accelerometer to recognize taps and those would be our buttons. So instead of having physical buttons, the user can double tap on the wearable and that would be the okay button. Or they could triple tap and that would be the panic button. And we got that working. We got the accelerometer recognizing these taps, but when we were testing it, we realized it wouldn't be a good idea to have this uh, in the system because uh, during a seizure, there's gonna be a lot of shaking and that could trigger uh, one or both of the buttons accidentally. So that's why we opted to go with physical buttons instead. Uh, the last challenge that we faced was interfacing uh, the Amazon Web Services with Django. That's something that we haven't learned and uh, we had to do our own research outside of class. Um, next, uh, you can see this is our Gantt chart. We started the project back in October. Uh, we completed the project. Uh, the only thing that we weren't able to complete yet is testing the wearable device uh, because of the delay of parts, but we have everything completed, and next week we will be meeting with an epilepsy group in Sonoma, in Sonoma and we're gonna give one of our systems to them to get more data. So uh, some of the future work that we're going to do is uh, includes uh, moving away from the feather module and using the onboard uh, arm chip instead to further shrink the size of the wearable. Uh, another thing is to, like Jaime said, use the test data from uh, volunteers from the epilepsy support group and also from uh, Art and his wife to further optimize our seizure detection algorithm. And another thing is to add a, a dial, either uh, onboard or uh, on the website to adjust the sensitivity. And another feature work is to improve the Django site by adding more user authentications. And so we learned a lot uh, about epilepsy, not just from our client and his wife, but also from uh, the support group. And it was really helpful to get their feedback on what we were doing. Um, and it was also useful to present our work elsewhere, such as most recently at a, a math conference where we presented our the mathematics behind our seizure detection, uh, detection algorithm. Uh, for the central module, since, like I said in the previous slide, uh, we never used Amazon Web Services or Django or MySQL database, so we had to do our own research on that. So one thing that we kind of came up with is that the uh, appliance controller, some challenges with putting that on someone's actual stove. Um, but uh, also we learned uh, some PCB design. 
And here's just some supporting courses. Uh, we, we not only used all these courses, but pretty much all, all of our other courses that we've been taking here. And so we, we want to especially thank our advisor and all of our, our teachers here and faculty, and um, as well as our client, Arthur, who's here. And, um, and the source funding helped us uh, get to the point where we can build three complete systems. Questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, how do you decide, how do you estimate the threshold that you need to use for the education? Mm -hmm. So uh, first we've kind of just uh, chose some numbers and we tested it ourselves just to see what, what, uh, what would set it off. And then we, we asked our, our client who came in and saw it and he would shake it and see and based on his pin, uh, feedback, we would change these thresholds until what he thought was good. And then when we actually give it to customers uh, to test it, then we're gonna get their feedback and probably change these thresholds too, some more. Yeah, so uh, we had to, by increasing the thresholds, it was, and we were testing it, um, we were able to do per normal activities without it going off, such as just walking or scratching your head or uh, wash, pretending to wash the dishes. So doing those things didn't set it off when we had these thresholds, but um, in the future, if we have lower thresholds, uh, we might have to find some way to uh, not detect these other normal movements. Yes. Yeah, uh, we did. We did do that actually, and that's something we presented at the math conference. We we looked. We did the Fourier transform and looked at the frequency components, uh, and we were we're looking. We're thinking about looking into ways to incorporate that into our real time algorithm. But um, uh, yeah, we're still. That's something we looked into and something we're also considering uh, implementing. So I think the most important thing we learned is to have a lot of patience when people ask you the same question over and over again. <laughs> no, honestly, we I think that um, an important thing here is the is the planning of of these the scheduling. So for example, if um, if I'm building a hardware system and the guy who's working on the software system doesn't have that hardware to work on, then that needs to be completed on time. So I think a lot of the planning was was very. Uh, Actually, it turned out to help us a lot in the end. Uh, yes. The appliance feature that will only uh, target 240 volt appliances. Go those yeah. So we um, we kind of decided that um, in the time frame that we had that we would focus mostly on the ability to control a uh, electric uh, relay. For example, you could have a gas stove, but um, we in the time frame we we didn't spend most of the focus on there. We do have a, a reliable control circuit that can switch um, a, a relay that can be externally attached to the module. Yeah, we, we did find some research where there, there was a lot of uh, activity in that area trying to look at e EKG d uh, data. But um, um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think uh, it would be interesting to correlate maybe the, um, the physical shaking that we're detecting to the, maybe the, the brainwave data. Yes, to build on that question, you mentioned that it, your application can provide valuable data to doctors as well. Decisions, so I suggest that you also talk to them 
to see what other applications or what type of data would be beneficial to them. We now start the second part of the senior design presentations. But before we start, uh, we'd like to recognize the outstanding work that our industry advisors have done throughout the past year. Um, you can find the complete list of our industry advisors in the, in the program schedule. I believe there is actually someone passing those around in case you don't have that. At this point, may I ask all of our industry advisors to stand up, please? Uh, we have Chris, we also have Art, we had a couple other people who left. Um, we have Shiva up there from Do Mobility. We have Robert Blue, he was there. We have Peter Oliver, could you please stand up? Thank you. We have, who else do we have? Who else? Robert left. Yes. Yes. Well, Robert Rue, thank you. So uh, on behalf of the department, I would like to thank all of you for your dedication and service to our students. So thank you so much for helping me. I also like to take this opportunity and to give a special thanks to one of our mentors um, that has been involved in multiple act initiatives and activities and has been a long time supporter of our program, Mr. Chris Stewart. Um, thank you, Chris, for all the work you've done. Um, Chris, Chris has kindly agreed to share some of his personal experience in terms of mentoring our students. So perhaps you can tell us a little about your experience. Go ahead, please. Fareed asked me to stand up and say a few words. Um, I just wanted to first start out with how impressed I am with what's going on here and, uh, and how proud I am of all the students here. I think we should give everybody a hand for all the extra work that's going on to get into this point. It's, it's, it's a, a phenomenal program here. I'm really, really proud to be part of it. I'm very privileged to be here and, and make that happen. I, you know, My background is that uh, I feel very privileged to even have been able to get to this point in my life. I grew up on a very small uh, farm in rural Appalachia back in, uh, back in the Midwest, and uh, college wasn't really something that was even talked about. I was the first person in, in you know, all the generations of my family to actually get to go to college, and uh, so I feel like this is an incredible privilege for me to be here where I am today and also be able to give back a little bit in this program. So. I, uh, I talked to Dean Stoffer a couple of years ago and said, you know, how can I help? And she pointed me to Fareed and his program here and a couple of other programs around on the university. And I've just been incredibly impressed ever since of, of what's been going on here and what, uh, what I see out of the students and what's happening. I think that, uh, you know, when I got here, I kind of just asked, you know, what can I do to help and how can I get involved? Um, part of it is I think my job is to come in to the uh, classroom and ask the students the hard questions you know now while they're in the middle of the program before they get out and get into the industry and start asking those questions in the in the uh, in the real world interviews and stuff so i've gotten some good feedback over the years that that's helpful sometimes it's helpful to hear that from an outside person not from necessarily from the professors in the school and, and make that happen so i've been very happy with the feedback that i've gotten along the way on that i think you know also i like being able to bring a real world perspective into the the uh the questions in the in all of the projects of what's happening and making this happen give some advice as we go along make things happen and I've been able to get involved in more than just this program here we had several of the students here actually in these programs that also went above and beyond this is a huge effort on their part to be able to do this program and be able to do with the hard work you see in all of this this is above and beyond for many of the programs in electrical engineering but I uh, also had a couple of teams out of this program that did the i program, which is a statewide competition. And uh, I think you should also be very proud of what's going on here at the school because uh, both teams that we mentored here from Sonoma State did very, very well, made it to the finals, which was not easy to do. You know, less than half of the teams that started made it to the finals. 
and then one of the teams actually uh, took the top award for for that year. So that that was really impressive when you think about what's going on here at Sonoma State for all of the state schools in California. So I'm really happy to be able to work with that. I think it's incredible to work with young people and see the energy of what's happening and, and you know the enthusiasm and their ability to kind of look beyond you know the the way things have been done before. I love David's comment when he talked about you know answering my question was one of the things he learned when he went to the conference was that. You know, other people have always thought about you had to do it a certain way. And, you know, being able to get the group to think outside the box, be able to do that, I love the fact that you can get the young people involved in that kind of stuff and make it happen. So I think that's really the trick. The innovation comes from not already, not already knowing how it's done or how it, you know, it's supposed to be done, but being able to say, can we take a different approach to make it work? That's been awesome. So. I just feel very blessed in my life to be able to uh, been to the point where I'm at and, uh, and have a great career in electrical engineering and then have been able to start my own company and make that work and so I've been uh, excited about it. I've, I've actually had uh, I think nine uh, internships from Sonoma State so far, uh, both the business school and the engineering school. We have multiple graduates now working uh, on our product line. If anybody has any questions, take a look at what the, your students are actually being able to accomplish. And, and be able to get the work done, but mainly I wanted to just talk about the uh, the value and the you know rewarding experience for me personally to be able to give back and be able to work with all the young people and and uh, and make that happen. So I would encourage anybody that's out there or anybody that they know to kind of get involved with the program. Being an industry mentor has has been uh, incredibly helpful, and uh, I've had many of the students come back. I had my first intern called me yesterday came back and is uh, and it's a very successful uh, career right now and uh, staying in touch and so it's a it's an incredibly rewarding experience I hope I'm contributing somewhat to make that happen and it's uh, it's something that the students will take away and be helpful for and we can stay in touch for a long time so if you have any questions or anything about the program and how it works and what I what I've been able to do please stop by and see me afterwards when we get done at one o'clock thanks a lot appreciate it um, I also just wanted to reiterate that everyone got a package like this. Inside this, there's a card. In case you're interested to work with the students and be a mentor in the following year, especially, or have some type of activities, mentoring, talking to students, please fill this out. We would love to contact you and get your opinion, get you involved. Um, at this point, I also wanted to introduce to you uh, Art. Art has been... Uh, um, our, they connect, what happened is last summer, Art contacted us and he said, I have a really cool project for your students. So I said, so okay, let's talk. So we went to Starbucks and sat down for about two and a half hours. And he was explaining to me what his project is. And I thought, this is really cool. We should definitely get in. So I mean, invited Art later when the senior design project started in, uh, this, in August. Uh, of last year, and Art started uh, kind of pitching his project idea. Um, and after that, it just we had a group of students who just presented their seizure detection um, project. And after that, it just kind of got its the life of its own, and it just started from there. And if you go to the table, you can see what the end product has been. And uh, I just wanted to just introduce to you Art, and perhaps he can also talk a little about his experience with working with the students. Thank you, Art. Hey, hello. My name is Arta Bukovic, and uh, a, if I Farid, thank you so much for taking my project because that was something that uh, I had in mind uh, to build device like that uh, myself but uh, since I don't have uh, full electronic knowledge uh, I, I had the idea that maybe I can find electronic engineer and build a device. So actually I met a customer of mine and he was electronic engineer uh, and I told him about my idea but he said you know I'm too busy how about maybe you submit this idea to 
electronic engineering department at Sonoma State University. And I know Farid. So let me talk to him. Well, Farid was gracious and, and uh, spent time with me listening about my ideas. And he told me, well, I'm not sure if the students will like to do this project. It's up to them. You have 30 minutes to submit your idea and let them decide. Also, I knew, OK, I have 30 minutes. I'm going to show my face for 30 minutes, and I will be gone. And this, this project is very important for me because I have wife. She was 39 and she developed epilepsy. And it's been 17 years. And there is no uh, solutions to cure her epilepsy. And lots of people actually experience that. About 2 million people in the United States have epilepsy. One third of the persons don't respond to medication. Well, so then people are stuck with their lives. So then there is a question. Do you love somebody? What does it mean? Do you care about them? You love, it means you will be for them when they are in trouble. So we can accept, well, you know, I bring my wife to, to the doctor and hope for the best, and we, which we did, and then say, well, that's life. Or you will say, well, is it some other way to protect from accidents? Uh, some people actually uh, having epilepsy, they suffocate. They, they fell and uh, if they, they are in bed, they suffocate and they die. So it needs to be immediate response from caretaker to, to really sometimes to be around as soon as possible. So of course, sometimes it is not possible. Nothing is 100%. So I was thinking, OK, what's the most dangerous thing in the house? Oh, it's stove. She's, luckily, she's able to cook and cook really well. Uh, most of the time, I'm trying to really disconnect the stove. But you know, we are humans. You may forget. So the solution is, is uh, technology use anything that we know and, and help people. And uh, there are different devices on the market like that. Uh, and not too many, but they don't have anything to disconnect the appliance. So that was very important for me. And uh, Aaron, Michael, Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you for taking my challenge. Uh, because you know, you you do help people. You will help people, you know, immediately. And and device itself, it, always you start with the device which is, you know, a, a, a prototype. And if you if you stick to it, uh, you will just keep keep building around. I'm not going to take more of your time. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you again. We now start with the second part of the presentation. I believe Jose.
it's coming. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jose Avila and I did the switch electric vehicle autonomous project, what I consider the first phase, what I could get done in less a year. So this is a quick overview of what I'm going to get into today, the problem, my uh, proposed solution, uh, testing, the requirements that I needed to meet, testing budget and some challenges and what I learned. So to give you an introduction, I'm working with a company called Switch Vehicles Incorporated uh, located in Sebastopol, California. They build electric vehicles uh, mainly for education, so kids in the Sonoma County School District can learn on how this technology works. And uh, you can see their model that they're committed to improving career tech education and inspiring a generation of makers. So. We all know that the, the technology is uh, going in, uh, in the direction of self-driving. All the major companies are doing it, Volvo, Tesla, BMW, and, and uh, the switch vehicle right now doesn't have any self-driving capabilities. And it will be nice that, that um, the curriculum can evolve with the technology that, that's growing today. So the, the kids in our uh, area can, can learn how this works and probably uh, um, help out. So I propose to uh, implement the necessary hardware to, uh, accomp so to give the vehicle self-driving capabilities. So using a, a LabVIEW, a, a graphical user interface, it will control the control module and control the hardware on the vehicle appropriately, which that, that would be the first phase, getting the car to react to my commands. And this is the existing hardware right now. There's a picture here so you get an idea what that schematic kind of looks like on the vehicle. And the, on the top box, that's the, uh, that controls direction, forward, reverse, and that's a manual switch. For the pedal, that's a, a pedal with the uh, a Hall effect, and you can control that with your foot. That's also a mechanical action. And also, to turn on the, uh, the headlights, the blinkers, there, that's also a switch. So what I propose is, Using LabVIEW, control that system, and by using control the steering using a, a DC motor, and then control the throttle with the with the circuit I'll design I designed, and I'll I'll go in detail on how I went about that. And for the uh, for the headlights and the blinkers, I will use a relay, just to keep on and off with the commands from LabVIEW. So the main, fo the main engineering requirement is that I, you can control the basic functions of the vehicle via LabVIEW, and that's a big one. And since this will be in a presentation environment, an adjustable max speed is very important if it's going to be around kids. So you want to uh, lower the, you, you want to decrease the max speed that the car can, will, will go. Uh, that's optimal so there's no accidents and all that. And since uh, kids might be using this uh, graphical interviews, I'll try to make it uh, educational, easy to use, fun to use, so they're getting excited on about uh, the the vehicle itself. So that's the uh, the throttle right now in the vehicle, and so what I did is I took it to the lab and I characterized it, see how it works, how it how it what output, uh, what the output that is that it gives you. So, and that's the design I, I came up with, and I'm going to go in detail how I went from that to that. So I started with this design, just to uh, because mainly it's a uh, inverting and no uh, negative rail because there's no negative voltage on the car and I don't want to have to deal with that. So I, I tested it and you can see that it, by inputting a, a range of zero to three volts, which is the output of my my uh, microcontroller, the output would not be linear. It would be linear until I would input uh, two volts. So that's not that's not optimal. I needed to be very linear. 
So what I did is I um, I came up with this one now, and it's in, I added the rail so it can encompass the output that I wanted, but it's negative. So what I, with the help of the faculty, we 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 kind of we came to a, a solution which is a two-stage opera operational amplifier, and with the gain that I want. And uh, a second stage that will invert it 180 degrees with unity gain, and that's the the output that I got, and that's the ideal. That's how the um, that's how the existing throttle <coughs> operates now. And I, I really like this because uh, it's a single input, one PWM signal from my board, uh, and I can control the the gain at any time, and I can control how much current if if that may be a problem, rather than just buying a, a digital pot. So I'm going to be using a PWM signal from the chip kit board that I am using, uh, but the the um, the throttle circuit that I that I uh, designed, it's going to only amplify PWM signal. So what I what I did is I put an RC uh, low pass filter at the end to clean up, and that's very linear too when you control duty cycle from in code, and that's the line. And the green line will fluctuate, will move up and down based on uh, the percentage of the width, the pulse width. And that's uh, all these tests are uh, satisfy my engineering requirements. And that's what it is now, and that's what I'm testing now on the vehicle uh, as we speak. I, I hope hope to get into a PCB soon, as soon as that I know it's uh, glitch free and it, it works exactly how I, I said it's going to work. As for steering, we know that you have to steer, you, uh, you have to use your two hands, and that's not autonomous, that's not self-driving capability. So I propose to use a DC server motor and put it in parallel with the steering column, as you can see the diagram on the bottom. And I'll be controlling the motor using step pulses of five microseconds, and it, it has a, a resolution of about 0.5 degrees. The data sheet said 0.2, but in the lab, when I characterize it in the lab, I, I, it's a, actually 0.5, but it's still... It still has good resolution. That's still that's okay. We're not gonna be worried about that. And uh, you can see that the blue dots that's how uh, that's a deviation, but it's still mainly linear. As I put in step pul the step pulses, and the yellow one you can see how uh, more uh, more. I don't want to do enough uh, points in the middle, so you can see with the big idea on how it. It deviates, but it's fairly linear, and I'll, I, that's what I have to. That's what it is. It's a very powerful motor, and it's cheap. And this is a relay circuit that I'm using to control the uh, horn, headlight, blinkers, and uh, and if anything is appended to the vehicle, then I can just add a relay circuit that just needs a uh, on or off. So this is what the uh, GUI looks like right now, and if you though you can adjust the max speed. Uh, forward and reverse with the uh, with the combo box on the left side and pressing the buttons you can control the, uh, the headlight horn uh, steering and the pedal I have a demo there if you guys want to play with it and find the what's wrong with it find all the glitches so in the all of my hardware has to be placed in the back of the car. That's the uh, the space I, I want to get it into. I want to get it into that. The the entire design will be there except the steering, the motor for steering. That'll be by the steering wheel. And that's me doing testing. And that's the vehicle that I'm uh, implementing my hardware on. So the budget I'm uh, at right now is uh, $227, which is way under that I what I proposed in December. Uh, that's mainly because the motor that I found is $75, and the preliminary motor was about $200, $300, and I was and I found I came across this one, which is very ideal. So that I I proposed a schedule that I was I try to follow, but. But on, my, on the way, I encountered some challenges. I uh, I lost a partner. He couldn't uh, know. He couldn't continue with me. So I had to rethink how am I going to attack this this uh, this problem. So I had to draw it out, which wasn't so trivial. 
And uh, I had some delayed parts, and when they did get here, they had limited documentation. So I had to characterize all of these components in the lab. And that, but the important thing is that I, I know how to do it, and I became an expert using an oscilloscope. So what did I learn? Like I said, I'm, I had to characterize many components in the lab, so I, I think I have a practical knowledge of these components beyond theory rather than just equations. I know how they work and how, how, uh, how act and mathematically speaking, you get this number, but when you test it out, it doesn't, sometimes it does not match. Again, in-depth understanding of equipment. I use all the equipment that's offered in the lab, which, which I didn't know how to navigate till this semester, and that's very helpful. And the importance of teamwork. You can't get much done if you're an individual. And communication, and I'm working with the, with the team at Switch, and just getting on the same page and getting the good momentum and be dynamic, that's very important too. And think outside the box. Sometimes you, you get stuck on one thing and um, sometimes I get too stubborn and I want it to work. I just maybe just back out and try to solve it from a different angle. So future work. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna continue testing on the vehicle and remove all glitches, make sure it's optimal. And I wanna add sensors because the end goal is uh, uh, self-driving autonomy. And I wanna put sensors on the vehicle and the sensor data will be relayed back to another module and it will uh, make a decision and control the, the module that I created this semester appropriately. And I uh, want to thank the uh, SSU Electrical Engineering Department for all their help, the uh, team at Switch Lab, and, I, and the funding from Source Award, which is, uh, I appreciate that, and the uh, SRJC for giving me a cool intern, help me out. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, my understanding is you are trying to amplify binary signals, either the one, right? Yeah. You don't need uh, a linear amplifier for that, because I could see you struggling with double supply. Yes. Plus or minus, I know, only one on the car. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do a very simple for a binary signal, like a switch, single transistor, mm -hmm. transistor inverter. It will amplify it all the way to the real voltage. So if you are using 6 volt, you can get it all the way up to 6. Mm -hmm. but that's an inverter, so you need another inverter to keep the phase right. So you need two transistors there to achieve the amplification there without having to struggle with uh, a two supply. Yeah, so. Look into this and you know, it might help you out there. Yeah, I, I understand there's uh, almost unlimited solutions to this to this effect, and, and this getting what, what to choose was uh, very hard too. So, this is what I chose, and I understand very well. I, I did it and end up supplying the negative 12 volts. So, I have that working right now, but I'll look into that so I can remove that uh, extra hardware that I had to put in. Yeah, It'll be more. Point. Yes. Build a monster there to make something simple, but this is not engineering. Mm. You have to optimize your design cost and reliability. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll look into that. Thank you. So, what type of sensors would you integrate in the future? Maybe like lidar, or lidar. Lidar. I've I, I've been looking into lidar, and that I like that how because it can it gives you a like a a map. And sometimes it can, uh, I've seen cases where it can tell you the depth of walls and you can go around things because it can bend and that's, I think that could, that'll be the best way other than just relying on proximity sensors. And uh, it just, and uh, that's where most companies are headed. So I think I'm gonna listen to them. So I think they know what they're doing. Yes. So uh, I haven't really thought about it because I'm I'm I'm, con I'm controlling this in a controlled environment in a lab. But yeah, I, I actually came across uh, because uh, I'm in a philosophy class this semester, and 
they found what the professor found out I was doing this project, and she said, "So who do you kill on the road? Do you kill yourself? You kill the the minivan with the kids, or the single guy and the driver?" And it just it, the whole class just went on that, and it made me think about. But yeah, I'm not. I haven't really thought about it since mainly I'm I'm focusing the motion control. But eventually, I will. I will get there. I think, and I don't. I think I'll leave that job to the philosophers. Yes, sir. In a project, you typically have scope, schedule, and resources that you can adjust. It seems like your, your uh, schedule is fixed because you need to finish it in a year. How did you adjust your scope? Like, what things did you not do when you lost the resources that you had in the project? So at the beginning of the year, I kind of wanted to add sensors and have it detect something its way and make it stop. But that was like, that's a two parts. So one, somebody would focus on the hardware on the, on the vehicle and someone would focus on the intelligence. But it's more important to do the hardware on the car than first priority than to do the intelligence because you can have a, the most intelligent system in the world, but if the car doesn't know how to react to it, then there's, it doesn't, there's no point. So that's what I focus this semester, to get the car actually to react to the commands that I give it and optimize that. Yes, sir. So what was the most important thing you learned in the whole project? Um, grit, you know, you have to stick it and just do it. It's, um, you know, sometimes things don't work, so you can't just give up. You have to maybe come back to it, but you have to keep stay focused. You can't deviate. I think that's, uh, and teamwork, that's very important communication, time management, which is I'm not very good at. Yes, sir. So is the car here? Yes, you can check it out outside. It's parked outside. Uh, I can show you uh, I can show you where I'm planning to do it and more in depth on what I what I'm proposing. It's yeah, it's pretty cool. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dustin Goodyear. This is my partner, Jordan Becerra. Today, we'll be talking to you about the Switch Electric Vehicle Inverter, or SEVI for short. Before we get started, I want to mention that our faculty advisor is Don Estrich, who's nice enough to join us today, as well as our client, Peter Oliver, and our intern, Michael Vargas. So now, moving into the project here, today we're going to talk about the problem that our product solves, as well as some of the challenges that we faced while uh, completing the project. And then we're going to move into some of the testing and the materials that it takes to build our project. So the problem that we're trying to solve is currently there's all these electric cars with huge batteries that everyone has. And there's really no inverter to utilize that power outside of driving the car. And what we really wanted to do was use this full available battery power to power our you know, household devices. Or you know, if we needed it in an emergency situation, we'd be able to use something like that with our electric car batteries. So some of the existing work, um, these, these inverters at the bottom here, these are primarily designed for gasoline vehicles, and they plug into the cigarette lighter, which limits the power. Uh, the main issue with these is that none of them utilize uh, any electric cars, the massive battery that's an electric car. So that's why we came up with the SEVI. So for our project, we did just that. We bridged the gap between electric vehicles and the existing power grid, providing a way to use the DC energy stored in electric vehicles battery and then convert it to AC power they use as a typical wall outlet. 
So this is our uh, big system overview. On the left, we have the electric vehicle and then the battery that our inverter plugs into. From the inverter, you can plug in um, a power strip and there's uh, multiple devices that you can plug in there. So it's a very simple design and it supports a variety of devices. So looking a little closer at the device here, uh, if, if you see the green, that's what we would have on the electric car itself, the battery and the battery management system, uh, modeled after switch electric vehicle system. Uh, the blue is, is basically our power system. We have uh, a 20 or 50 volt regulator that regulates the, our 72 to 144 volts to exactly 50 volts. That way we don't have fluctuation while we're draining the battery. Uh, and then we also have a PIC microcontroller, some LED status lights, as well as a thermal sensor to kind of monitor what's going on with our device and make sure uh, it doesn't overheat. So uh, looking a little into the implementation of the actual device, we decided to use a, a push-pull uh, architecture. Basically, this uses a center tap transformer with applying 50 volts to the center tap and having a transistor on either side switched at alternating. Uh, we uh, form a 115 volt square wave at the output uh, and we're using the IR2153 driver to accomplish the switching and uh, the, uh, the mean well voltage regulator that that's what regulates our voltage to 50 volts. And uh, a little bit more about the driver and the safety system, we actually put them all on the same PCB to save some space in our system. Uh, they ha it has some status lights here and uh, these two holes right here would we be where the wires come out for the gates of the transistors. Uh, as well as this is a voltage regulator to regulate our 12 volts to 5 volts for our PIC microcontroller. So looking at some of the key components for our device, we're going to start off with the power transistors. You can see that in the middle, the TO247 package. This is very important because it uh, does the switching for our device, which creates the down and up rising of the AC signal as well as the uh, voltage regulator in the bottom left. That's in charge of uh, taking that large battery voltage, that's 72 to 144 volts, and stepping it down to a nominal 50 volts so that we can use it. And so when the battery goes down in voltage over time, our uh, power will be the same. Another thing I want to mention is the toroid transformer in the top right. That was a very integral part to our uh, process as that steps up the voltage from 50 volts to 110 volts. Some of the challenges we faced with the inverter design was switching the inverter design. We started off with a full bridge architecture, and then we found out about halfway through this semester, around February, then February, that it would no longer work because of the, um, the voltage difference that we weren't able to test with. So we ended up going with the push-pull design, so that set us back significantly. Now moving into that with the push-pull design, we needed to find high voltage and high current parts. And these weren't exactly readily available at your regular old Radio Shack or anything like that. Um, more specifically, the transformer and the voltage regulator. Now for both of these, we had to look online at various places and weren't able to find anything. We ended up calling many companies and spent some time on the phone and then we tell them about our project and then they tried to match a product to us. So we kind of had to work around the specs that were available on the market and that's how we came up with those. Another challenge we had was uh, obviously obtaining parts in time. We had a budget through the school, so we had to order most of our parts through there. And they had to basically come to us through the school, which would take a little bit longer than if you know you ordered something to your house, uh, as well as budget concerns. Uh, and you know we were on a limited budget, as I mentioned. And uh, we really, you know, we already had some free stuff that we got, and as well as Peter Oliver bought us some parts, and we didn't want to blow through our whole budget. So that was another challenge that we had to deal with. So looking into some of the requirements for our product, these are the marketing ones, and we wanted to make sure that our product was environmentally friendly because we're trying to re replace the existing gasoline um, inverter ones. And then also we wanted to make sure that the device wouldn't require any special training or any prior knowledge so that the user can very easily operate it. Some of our engineering requirements that we thought were important here highlighted. Uh, the device must support 110 volt AC at 60 hertz. That's typically what you'd see out of an outlet in a house or somewhere else. Uh, and typically what most of your electronics run off of, chargers, stuff like that. Uh, device must also be able to supply 10 amps nominal output. We did fall a little short of this requirement. We were able to do about 900 watts, which equates to a little under 9 amps. But we're still pumping some significant power through the inverter. Uh, and some more engineering requirements here. Uh, device must have a physical switch uh, to prevent st standby power drain. 
This is simply because we don't, we're on limited power with batteries already. We don't want to drain extra power when we're not using the device. So looking uh, a little bit into the testing that we did, we have uh, a few tests here that we thought were the most important. Uh, the IR2153 driver test, uh, as well as the testing with the different architectures of the inverter itself, as well as the safety system and final system flow testing. The, uh, this is our IR2153 that we talked about previously. This is basically our gate driver for our system. And what it does is it switches the uh, MOSFETs at alternating intervals. That way we have them switching back and forth to create our, our square wave at the output. And as you can see by this photo here, that is basically the output of the IR2153. Uh, and the cool part about this chip, chip is it has uh, integrated dead time so that none of the pulses are on at the same time, which keeps us from having the shoot through condition where we have uh, current going through both MOSFETs at the same time. So as I mentioned earlier, we uh, switched the architecture of the device. This is the test of the full bridge that we used originally. Um, this failed because the gate to source voltage wasn't significant enough and we tested above 12 volts. So we had to switch our design there. And um, we also used to use a 555 timer for the uh, input instead of the 2153. Now that driver um, was incapable of supplying the dead time like you mentioned, so we were having some problems with the current rushing through. Moving into the safety system, as Jordan mentioned before, um, this is designed to cut off the power to the complete device if the temperature reaches a certain point, and that point is 95 degrees Celsius. Uh, we determined that would be a good um, temperature because our devices can operate higher than that, but we don't want them to get anywhere near the max temperature. So you see in the bottom left, there's a graph of the temperature versus the resistance values that we measured using the NTC thermistor down in the bottom there. And after this test, we concluded the cut. Sorry. After this test, we concluded that it worked just fine and it protected our device. So, as Dustin mentioned, we uh, eventually went to the push-pull architecture, where we have uh, 50 volts on the center tap and either MOSFET on either side. Uh, and this was actually our second attempt, and uh, we tried this with 12, then 24, then 50 volts, and it worked a lot better than the full bridge system was working because we didn't have that that we didn't have to have that high voltage on the gates of our transistors that we would need with a high side driver using a full bridge architecture. Uh, and we basically concluded that this is the inverter design that would be the best for our system. So then uh, after we decided everything and we had our driver in our system, we decided we want to do some, lo some load testing on our final system. So uh, basically it's the, the IR4321 MOSFET switched by the IR2153 driver and it outputs a 60 hertz at 115 volt AC square wave. So if you're fortunate enough to come check out our demo at the break earlier, um, you can see that we had a couple things plugged in. Um, for our testing here, if you see top to bottom, the power goes up as we move down. We wanted to test a variety of devices to make sure that our um, device would work just as a standard wall outlet. Now for these tests, we uh, did them from a 10 minute to a 30 minute duration. We wanted to make sure that not only would they plug in and work, but would they stay working over some time. Now if you notice at the bottom there, we failed to uh, power the 1200 watt uh, Wagner heat gun. And while we did fail to power it completely, it still did run just fine. It just didn't sound like it was heating up quite as quick, you know, it wasn't as hot. So that's one thing we noticed. But we were uh, lucky enough to be able to brew a pot of uh, fresh coffee, which was 900 watts, and that was very significant for us. Now, when we're looking at those power figures, we want to make sure that we're being efficient here. So for efficiency, we wanted to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible, so we bought uh, transformers and voltage regulators that were as efficient as possible. And also, um, when we measured the efficiency of our device, we took the device with no load on it, and we concluded that it drew 0.67 amps at 50 volts, which equates to about 33 watts. Now for this, um, we did that some math, and we equated that our device is about 96.4% efficient. So looking at our schedule here, uh, we talked about the design change along the way, and that happened really towards the end of February, the early March. Uh, that's when we kind of switched from the full bridge setup to the uh, push-pull setup, uh, and it kind of threw us back a little bit, you know, uh, we were already developing the full bridge and kind of set us behind. 
Right, so the components that we used for this device are listed here. Um, our budget in the bottom right, or the total amount of money we spent was $639.69. Um, our budget that we received from the source funding was $750. Now while there is a few dollars left in that budget, uh, we, did, uh, we weren't able to use all of it because, um, as you see on the top, the voltage regulator, uh, Peter Oliver of Switch Vehicles was nice enough to purchase that for us. And the transformers just below that were gifted to us by Triad Magnetics. So we're great, uh, very grateful for them. Talking about some of the future work we could do with this, uh, obviously a square wave isn't the ideal output of an inverter. You really want to have a sine wave to have, be able to use any device flawlessly, especially sensitive equipment. And uh, the way to do this is to basically use the same kind of setup with pulse width modulation on our, uh, basically a pulse width modulation driver circuit to switch our MOSFETs similar to what you see here or in these pictures here with alternating pulse widths. That way we have, uh, we basically mimic uh, a, a sine wave from the RMS of the, the signal. Uh, and also smaller, more compact device would be better because we're on limited space with the electric vehicle uh, and more robust and weatherproof. Some more future work I'd like to add is that while in the back there you can see we have a battery array set up to test on, uh, we weren't actually able to put the device on the vehicle, so we'd like to do that in the future just to make sure it works, even though we're using the same exact battery that's on some of the models of the Switch vehicles. Another thing that I want to add is that some of the batteries uh, operate in different ranges, so that's another thing we want to test on is some uh, different batteries that Peter Oliver offers at Switch Vehicles. To conclude our presentation, I'd like to give special thanks to uh, Triad Magnetics. They donated two transformers, over $300 worth of transformers, as well as uh, Don Estrich, our faculty advisor, was very helpful throughout the whole semester, guiding us along and helping us here and there. Um, also, in our industry manager, Peter Oliver, like I said, donated uh, his time and some of his money to help us with our project. And then lastly, Sonoma State University for providing us with testing space and this lovely project. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So did you guys look at any other modes like laser printers that have very specific profiles in that powering up that is very tough on inverters? Um, fortunately, we did not. We wouldn't anticipate plugging a printer into a vehicle too often. Um, that's something we could look into, though. Good job. Yeah. Can you check the uh, output, uh, sound trigger output, uh, as far as you know, uh, the cleanness of that and so forth, and then how much noise you can Are you talking about the output of the transformer, of the plug? Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for that, we're getting a square wave. And there, um, it does clean up significantly more when there's a load on it. If you want to touch on that a little more. Yeah, it's just we kind of have some peaks from the switching. It's kind of like a debouncing effect that we see in our square wave. And you can kind of hear it when you, uh, you, you the, the inverter's powered on. Uh, and when you put a bigger load, it calms it down a little bit. Is there any plan for uh, making it cleaner? Right, that's what we were talking about with the pulse width modulation here. That would convert it from a, uh, a square wave basically to a sine wave output. We tried using uh, filters and, and stuff like that, but the problem is, is for a specific load, we would have to design a specific filter. And the uh, components for the high voltage and current would be significantly large. And Very hard big to... capacitors and inductors that would be kind of impractical for a small inverter. Right. Yes, Brandon? Can you, um, what's the difference between a power transistor and a normal transistor? You said they're using MOSFETs. Are they CMOS? And why would you use We're using N channel MOSFETs. Uh, and really it's because the, of the, the way the, the gate works on a MOSFET, we're able to switch it with very little current, which is what we need with our driver. Because we're only using uh, 12 volts at under a quarter of an amp as a power source, really. Yes, sir. So transformation efficiency is extremely important for mm -hmm. all converters, regardless. The number that you put there, 96%, is too good to be true. <laughs> yes, that, that's just kind of something we came up last minute with our... Because the way you are measuring it, you are measuring it with no load. Right, right. How do you measure power with no load? 
you have to measure total power versus input power, and that's your efficiency. Okay. And it is never 96 percent. All right. Try it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the second point is uh, uh, your output will be, um, you know, to put it in a slang word, is not clean. You have harmonics. Right. It's a square wave. Yeah, okay. we're aware of that. You have you will have a third harmonic. Second would be very small. It's, it's mostly the third and the right. fifth harmonic. And as you already mentioned, cleaning the third harmony, which will be at 180 hertz, the fundamental at 60 will be extremely difficult. Right, right. And that's what we ran into. That you already said. Yeah. Right. Okay, so cleaning it is a heck of a job. Yeah, that's why we want to do the pulse. And we thought about so. using, uh, you know, a low pass filters or a band pass filter, but it's no, just too hard. Your capacitor will be that big. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. So you cannot because 180 hertz is way too low. Mm -hmm. uh, the third thing is, your uh, thinking about either one is good, but my suggestion is to try to build some regulation into the PW1 to control the output with the load <coughs> to keep the output mm -hmm. constant. Okay. okay. And the way to do it is to control the width of the pulses. Right. To right. compensate for drop in the system as the load change. So a lot of the pulse width modulation uh, integrated circuits that we were looking at when we were looking into doing uh, pulse width modulation actually have feedback for, to the chip itself. So it kind of monitors itself as it's going and makes sure that the pulses are, are okay and everything. So what was the most important thing? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think probably for us was not to underestimate the short amount of time that we have. Really, you know, at the beginning of the semester or the year, it seems like you have a long, a long time, but you really don't. And, uh, you know, for us, we've never really developed something like this before. And uh, we were doing something that it was really a challenge for us because uh, neither of us have taken any high power classes or anything. Uh, we kind of just had to learn a lot of stuff by ourselves, asking Don or, you know, other internet, whatever. So, you know, it took us a lot longer than we actually anticipated it would take us. And, uh, you know, if I could go back, I would tell myself to hurry up, maybe. <laughs> Another thing I want to mention that uh, I learned during this was while this is such a massive project, uh, I kind of had to remind myself not to forget I was taking other classes. It'd be kind of be like, okay, what I have to do is today is like work on senior project, work on senior project. Be like, oh wait, I have a test the next day. So time management was definitely a key factor, and I wanted to make sure that while I was gonna pass senior design and good project and make it work, I also wanted to make sure that I got A's in my other classes so that I can graduate because that's very important. <laughs> <laughs> like like Brendan's class, specifically Brendan's. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, I mean, Switch Vehicles has a lot of different batteries that they put in their cars. Uh, Peter, his personal car has a really big battery. Uh, the batteries that we're actually using back there are just kind of deep cycle uh, car batteries that you would use for like, a, I don't know, like related to a golf cart or something. Uh, and those have obviously aren't as good as like lithium ion batteries and stuff like that. But uh, we, we, through all of our testing, we didn't charge those batteries at all. Yeah, we, like we didn't charge them at all. We dropped about two volts in our two weeks of strenuous testing. We've used sawzaws on it. Yeah. We brewed pots of coffee, just had anything playing on it, charging our laptops. So, so they last quite a while. Yes. So to answer your question, I do believe you'd be able to use it for a situation like that. So we could do that, maybe not run a refrigerator that kind of thing? You could run that stuff, and then uh, you could also recharge the car through solar and use this as like a power bank in your house. With the actual device that we have back there, we are actually limited by, with our voltage regulator by the amount of wattage we're putting in. So uh, really, if, if we were able to upgrade the components, basically, we, there could be a, a higher limit to the amount of power we could output to power refrigerators or whatever, you know. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.
just uh, Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our project is the multimode optical fiber test bed. Our uh, advisor is Dr. Brendan Hamill Bissell. Uh, my name is Nader Sarigi. I'm Maya Crockett. And I'm Joe Nolan. And so, a quick overview of actually what we're going to talk about today. We're going to st get started with our introduction, jump down to our problem and our solution go over some of our architecture as well as um, future work, what we learned, and we're going to wrap it up with questions. Okay, as a bit of an introduction, optical fibers are used in a lot of everyday applications that people use every single day. And optical transceivers are required uh, to send data through uh, optical fibers. And in order for the, these everyday applications to work properly, rigorous testing of them is required. And uh, so what's the problem? What's the motivation? What are we hoping to accomplish here? There is a wide array of test equipment used to do the testing that we just described. And in the absence of an automated testing system, the person doing the testing has to become familiar with each of the uh, pieces of equipment they need to use. And a lot of times that means becoming very familiar with a series of user manuals. And shown here at the bottom is a line of optical transceivers uh, waiting to be tested. Uh, and so our solution, the automated optical fiber test bed, uh, we basically took all the existing optical equipment uh, at SSU's uh, EE department and uh, we kind of integrated it together and automated it, automated the test process using LabVIEW. Uh, so now all the user has to do is insert the device under test, uh, click a button to initialize the test, um, characterization will happen and then the data is exported to a spreadsheet. So now we're actually going to go ahead and jump into some of our requirements that we've had for the project. So for our marketing requirements, some of the most important ones, one and two here, determine receiver sensitivity as well as the timing margin of an optical transceiver, and also decrease human error and improve repeatability through automation. And as far as the engineering requirements go, definitely using LabVIEW to automatically acquire, display, and log data as well as provide data formatting options specific to research or industry testing purposes. Uh, and so shown here is an overview of our system architecture. Uh, basically any of the test equipment we wanted to communicate with is uh, connected through a GPIB daisy chain, which is commonly found in industry. And uh, we could also retrieve data uh, through that as well. And so uh, generally what happens is uh, our bit error ratio tester down here has a pattern generator. And it generates an electrical uh, pseudo-random bit sequence pattern and it sends it to our optical transmitter where it then uh, converts it from an electrical to an optical signal using a laser. Uh, we send it through some fiber through our attenuator and then to a switch where at that point we can either send it to the multi-wavelength meter where uh, you can measure power at multiple wavelengths uh, or it sends it back to the receiver where it converts the optical signal to an electrical signal and sends it back to the BERT's error detector. And uh, it then compares the output uh, pattern to the input pattern to see if any errors were generated. Uh, and then here's the actual physical setup. Uh, we have our bit error rate tester down there, our transmitter and receiver, which would normally be the device under test. So you can plug in different devices there. Our optical attenuator, um, multi-wavelength meter, and our optical switches there. And uh, this we sometimes use as a clock, an external clock source. Okay, now for our project, we have basically three areas of emphasis, which are uh, research, industry, and education. And shown here is the research tab of our graphical user interface. And here on the left is where the plot of the timing margin test will be. And here is the plot for the receiver sensitivity as well as a few user-defined uh, variables, like the user can determine how many actual bits they want to test for each test. They have the option to either export it to a spreadsheet or not, as well as the opportunity to do several tests uh, in succession. Uh, and here's the, uh, the next uh, front panel that we, uh, uh, we specified it towards industry testing. So uh, it moves on to the next uh, sampling point um, when it 
breaches the error threshold rather than collecting every bit of data. And so the user can uh, define their uh, pass-fail parameters for the timing margin, the lower and upper unit interval, uh, which Joe will explain in a minute. And uh, also the pass-fail parameters for receiver sensitivity, so they can specify a minimum power required for their uh, given bit error ratio. Uh, and so what happens when you press this button is it runs uh, the test uh, sequentially, uh, and then uh, these lights will indicate whether the tests pass or fail. And here we have our educational front panel. So basically the way that it works is that the user gets to select um, which type of equipment they want to use. So basically we uh, specify which one they should choose and they can choose that via GPIV. From here, you start out from the attenuator and you know you're starting from the attenuator because the LED will be lit. And then from there, you get to choose the length of fiber that you would like to use. So for us, we have either one meter or 200 meters. So basically you can choose anything in between there. From there, that's sent to the second switch. And then you have the option of choosing the multi-wavelength meter or the receiver. So let's say, for example, I chose the multi-wavelength meter. You could actually set the attenuation. So the higher the attenuation, the lower your power is going to be. So basically, with that set, you could actually push this read power, and it would be reflected here. And it would also be reflected on our um, equipment as well, too. Now we're actually going to go ahead and jump into some of our testing as well. So here now is an example of an eye diagram. So basically this is just an overlaying, uh, this is just an overlaying sample of images and from there it's going to be a sample of bit, it's going to be a sample of, so it's going to be a sample, sorry that's not cool, this is going to be a sample of pseudo random bit sequence from the pattern generator on the bird. Nice. And so for our timing margin test, we established 100 points here along the threshold of the eye. And what's, uh, what we should note right now that for this uh, image, the horizontal axis is in time, picoseconds. But for our timing margin test, we sort of normalized this horizontal axis into what's called a unit interval with a width of one. Uh, going from negative 0.5 to 0.5 to represent the bit period. And so here are some results, and uh, this is a comparison of the tiny margin test with a length of one meter and 200 meters. So loosely speaking, there's a clock associated with sending data, and uh, so the receiver will then have to recover that clock and so the timing margin or is sort of the width or the amount of time within which those two clocks have to be in synchrony to uh, recover the data at a specified bit error rate. Um, now we just looked at plots of our timing margin test, so now I have a question for all of you. What do you think the plot would look like if someone came along and did this to your fiber? And it's a relevant question because that's precisely what Dr. Hamill Bissell did when he came to see a demo of our work so far. He promptly picked up a pen and started winding the uh, fiber around the pen and my job almost hit the ground when he did that. And so now we'll show you what it looks like. And so as we mentioned before, you can do successive tests. So I, we had the counter at two. So for, the, for this first test, I think you had like maybe two turns and we still did, it's narrow, but you can see there is still a bit of a timing margin. But this is the one that seemed to please him the most where we had <laughs> errors at, along the entire bathtub. And that was what he was looking for to make sure he could corrupt our data. Uh, and then here's what the uh, output from our receiver sensitivity test would look like. So uh, down there on the x-axis is power. Um, and then up here we have uh, bit error ratio. So uh, as power decreases, uh, you get a higher bit error ratio as you would expect. Um, and then uh, for the research panel, um, at the end of the test, it will export the data to a spreadsheet if the user uh, checks the box. And uh, it comes with a timestamp as well as a device ID tag that the user can type in so they can remember what they tested. And then uh, also the X and Y axis data that you saw in the plots as well as some other data that uh, gets exported to the spreadsheet for future uh, reference or analysis. Now on to our equipment costs. So in order for us to actually run this test bed, it costs right around $22,000. 
So that's not actually money that we had to spend. Uh, fortunately enough, Sonoma State actually had this equipment. So the only money that we actually had to spend was $245 here, uh, which we were fortunate enough to get from our source funding. So it was very, um, it was very nice on our pockets compared to Sonoma State's pockets. And then as far as our project schedule goes, so um, this is our original schedule. Um, it stayed pretty true. We've stayed true to it for the most part uh, with the occasion of some hiccups. So we did actually have to uh, work together a lot instead of on um, our own, for example, on like some of the testing. Um, so some of the challenges we faced with this project, um, for me personally, I had to learn LabVIEW throughout the course of this project. So that was a bit of a challenge. And also uh, Joe and I were running different versions of LabVIEW. So when we wanted to like share code, uh, we would have to like recompile it into a different version, and then some of our functions would break, and so that was kind of a challenge. Um, also, uh, on our BERT, initially when we were uh, sending commands to it, we weren't getting the expected results, and uh, we were a little bit afraid to try to update any of the firmware or anything on it, um, because it's a bit of an old piece of equipment. Um, but after getting in contact with Keysight Support, uh, one of their applications engineers, uh, he had like, he was able to point us in the direction of uh, the updated firmware, and uh, after that, uh, everything went pretty well. Well, not everything, but yeah. <laughs> oh, and then also um, on the user interface, uh, determining what to allow the user to control, um, you know, give them some uh, freedom to customize their tests while not making it too complex and time consuming. And as uh, we mentioned before, in the absence of an automated test system, you need to become familiar with all the equipment. So we had to go through that process as well. And the BERT alone has five user manuals associated with it. And so a big uh, challenge for us was translating the programming guide into usable Skippy commands that would actually work. It, in, in other words, that the BERT would actually listen to us and do uh, what we were asking of it. And getting consistent results, I mean, we, uh, it was slow going for us at first. and. Uh, a big one was as talk about 11th hour debugging and equipment failure. As recently as this past Sunday, we found that the multi wavelength meter was beginning to freeze up intermittently and also then started throwing errors, telling us we had syntax uh, errors, which we knew that we didn't. And sure enough, the equipment was passing on rest in peace <laughs> and fortunately we walked out and looked in the lab and there was the exact uh, a spare piece of equipment we switched that out and then also I think it was about the same time maybe even simultaneously there was a glitch in some of our code where we were relying on a variable a parameter coming from the BERT and the sign switched it went from it had been negative all of a sudden it was positive and thankfully we noticed it and uh, we were able to fix that. But both of these happened, uh, this was this Sunday, and we had poster presentation on Wednesday, so. Um, and so uh, some of the lessons we learned, <clears throat> don't underestimate the uh, amount of time it takes to do a project like this, uh, especially with the unanticipated problems that will arise. <clears throat> uh, definitely for me, uh, staying up to date with documentation. So um, it was my job to actually take all this complex stuff that you guys just heard about and turned into layman terms so anybody could really understand it. So just basically staying up to date and making sure I was doing that at the same time as they were, you know, maybe writing the timing margin test or the receiver sensitivity test was really big. Yeah, as far as lessons learned, I mean, in a practical sense, you have, uh, we got better with LabVIEW, better, more familiar with the testing equipment and uh, designing a test process. But also, what a big lesson that I learned was the value of tenacity, because we would go days, perhaps even a week or two at a time, without really making much progress. And it would have been easy to uh, give up hope, but through uh, teamwork and collaboration and uh, thinking outside the box and updating the firmware, we were able to begin to get uh, good, valid data. And the other thing is, we've called it have fun there, but the idea that I'm trying to get across is to remember how incredibly fortunate we are to spend every day in, in an atmosphere of intellectual curiosity and problem solving, and to remember that while you're going through all these seeming hardships. 
And then as far as our future work goes, uh, we do want to add a couple things to the test bed, um, preferably jitter, as well as an eye diagram for our educational panel, uh, educational panel uh, dispersion, and also some S parameter tests. And here are just some of our supporting courses, but as someone mentioned earlier, we basically utilize everything we've learned um, at SSU. And for references, are there any questions? I uh, guess. So why do you guys use GPIG versus LAN? Because some of the equipment might be too old to have LAN. Um, some of it was. Um, we just had GPIB available, and uh, we had you know the Skippy commands, and so we just thought we'd go with that. And most of those uh, test equipment were already daisy chained via oh, okay. GPIB, so you know, we start where we were. Oh, uh, and then uh, Chris, to answer your question, um, <laughs> uh, I'd say um, like planning. Uh, so just uh, for us, we had to like learn our, our hardware as we win. So if you had like really good knowledge of your hardware beforehand, that would be uh, definitely an upper hand for future students. So try to figure out what kind of hardware you're gonna use in your project and just learn it really well. And so you know what you're gonna get when you try to communicate with it. And also to add on to that, um, being able to start this project and not really know anything about any of this equipment and then being able to learn it to the point where I could explain it to somebody else was really big because like I said the first day I walked in I was like I don't know what half of this stuff even is I didn't even know we had this lab to be honest <laughs> and I was able to actually kind of I don't want to say dumb it down but I was able to dumb it down basically so that anybody could really understand it um, we have a manual as well as a quick start guide too yeah and I would say first of all I could echo the sentiments of all the other students what they learned but time management uh, is a big one and the fact that for this particular project, even once we were getting started, it was still kind of a blank slate, a lot of unknowns, and the, the progress was slow. And so time management and recognizing that there were other things that you could do, and perhaps not letting the documentation fall through the cracks as much as it did, because it was easy to just get so consumed with uh, trying to get results. Yes, sir. Considering you knew so little about this thing when you started, why did you pick this project? Um, well, I think we had all just finished taking a Dr. Hamelwistle's uh, optics class, and it was just really, uh, uh, it seemed really cool. It was really practical Fiber as well, too. Like, like he's saying, um, a lot of people were telling us that this is something that you would actually maybe do at a, at a job, you know? So we really wanted something that was practical and that would actually give us um, hands-on experience with stuff that's potentially in the job field currently. Yeah, and for me, like Natter said, I was fascinated with the optics and it just seemed so space age and super cool to communicate with the light uh, through fiber. And uh, there was the definite practicality in that virtually any manufacturer has test engineers. And so there's a higher ability that I was hoping to achieve out of that, as well as I didn't understand at the time how much more difficult this project was going to be compared to understanding total internal ref refraction, reflection and the way the geometry that is so easy to understand in uh, optics, uh, this project was nowhere near that easy. But that's what kind of drew me in. Uh, yes, sir. Sure, this is very nice. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to learn. Uh, one thing that uh, I would like to know is to have automated the test process, meaning if you have a, a, a program of, or a process where you have multiple readings without your intervention. Uh, we had considered that and uh, dreamed of doing that, and mm -hmm. definitely if we had uh, the resources and we had you know the time, we would definitely but then why why you bother about, about the GPIB if you don't automate? Well, GPIB is for automation. Yeah, but uh, just even simply uh, setting it up, like 
if you want to take a measurement from the, the power meter, just switching it, because we had to use two separate switches due to the limited uh, input-output ports. It takes a, a little bit of time, you know, so this still uh, would save you time if you were just making a small change at the input, and then uh, you do the characterization, and then you could manually make another small change at the input, and doing the characterization is kind of the process that has been automated. And I'm also hopeful that there's a scalability to this in that once this, now that we have this process, we built into it the opportunity to do successive tests. But what I think I'm hearing you ask is to do different devices in a row with one no, button? You, you want to get multiple readings for whatever parameter uh, and have to adjust and combine the different setup all this setup, and you have to change the setup when you change the data point. Mm -hmm. And the, do it, the way you do it, you either do it through the front panel, push button, manual, okay? Or you do it automatically by talking to the instrument through a GPID interface. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So since you are using the GPID interface, my expectation is that you want to have multiple readings under multiple conditions to get set of data for the performance. But apparently, you did not do that. So I was wondering why you bought up about the GPI. So, so I want to do one reading at a time, then push buttons. So I, I feel uh, we did automate the process because um, if we go back here, for example. Uh, So to do the receiver sensitivity test, for example, if we have to, you would have to, um, you know, uh, we measure the initial power with zero attenuation. And then uh, you, you increase the uh, attenuator, you know, by your step size. I let the user define that. And then, uh, <coughs> so then you have to uh, measure the bit error ratio at that attenuation level. Then you'd have to increase attenuation once again, and then measure the, uh, the bit error ratio again, so that process is automated. Um, maybe uh, we don't have as much experience, uh, you know, in in the industry, so maybe we're not seeing exactly what you're saying. But I'm sure there's plenty of room to improve. Um, uh, it is, add it on is to very it. nice, and you know, very good job. <clears throat> yeah. Talking to the to the instrument by itself is is a very good thing to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> Hello, we are the uh, Mobile Data Harvester team. We are the last presentation for today. Um, our advisor is Dr. Chris Hawley and Dr. Fareed Armand. Our industry advisor is uh, Mr. Sean Hedrick. Uh, my name is Abe Palmer. I'm Taylor Jones. I'm Joshua Pop Nicholas. So just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, problem solution, the marketing engineer requirements, testing and results, the materials and costs, and our timeline. So collecting environmental data is pretty important, um, especially in today's world. Um, for example, if you want to test the soil moisture to see if it's suitable for crops grow, or um, if you want to check the temperature to see or describe an ecosystem, there's a various number of um, things you could do with um, collecting uh, environmental data. Um, the problem is that um, sometimes uh, like sensors might be in hard or far to reach locations and it's definitely by foot, it could be difficult to get there or even dangerous. So what we're, we're proposing is instead of having the user walk out themselves, we would attach a wireless transmitter to their sensors, and then we'd have a device that we're calling a mobile node, which has a wireless receiver attached to it, which we would then mount to an unmanned aerial vehicle, or UAV, which would then fly out autonomously to the sensors and gather the data wirelessly, and then come back to the user, and they could just get it from the UAV. 
So here's a visual diagram of our project, the mobile node, which is in blue. Um, within, when it gets into within the certain GPS range of each sensor node, it would transmit their data. In this case, it's going to be humidity, temperature, and soil moisture. And um, it also have to go in, in each order. So it can't go to sensor node two or sensor node three first. It has to go in one, two, and three. And then that's when that mobile node comes back via UAV to the user, and then they unplug the SD card from the mobile node, and then they get a, a program via MATLAB to, to view the environmental data. Um, so this is a closer look at the, um, one of the sensor nodes. Um, so you have this is based on a UC32 board, which is um, uses a PIC32 microcontroller. Um, it's using it has the three sensors right about there, um, and then also we have a real time clock to um, timestamp and record the, when the data was collected. We have an SD card module um, that's so it can record the data on an SD card. Uh, this is powered um, through a solar panel which charges a battery, um, and then the battery is. The voltage from the battery is converted to 3.3 to volts to power the device. And then we are also using ZigBee protocol, um, and we're using XP module, and we have uh, antenna for the range at 900 megahertz. Uh, this is also a closer look at the mobile node. It's pretty similar, except it doesn't have the three sensors. Um, it's also using a WF32 board, which is like a slightly upgrade version of the UC32. Um, it has a GPS receiver, so um, when the mobile node gets in range of a sensor node, the GPS, um, it will know the GPS proximity of it and it will collect the data from the sensor node that way. Again, it's using a ZigBee protocol, so it has another um, XB module to it. And um, the power is coming from the UAV at 5 volts. And um, yeah. So after the user has their data, it's saved onto an SD card. And so what the user can do is then they put it into their computer. You provide a MATLAB program for them that takes the data, which is actually in a CSV file and converts it into a nice, much more easier to read uh, Excel file with labels and everything for them. The uh, MATLAB program also provides the user with the interface that lets them program the GPS coordinates into the mobile node so they don't have to reprogram the whole thing every time. And also, it uh, will let the user know if one of the sensor nodes are down through a little interface on the, uh, in the MATLAB. So we dealt with a lot of challenges in this project. First and foremost, we had to keep the mobile node small, small enough and lightweight enough to actually fit on the UAV we were using. We also wanted that mobile node to distinguish between each sensor node, so there'd be a different uh, transmit character for each sensor node. Plus, um, we had to initiate a flag for each sensor node when, if they were down or a sensor node was down. Um, we also had to keep the we had to make sure that our sensor nodes weren't like too secluded. That way, the vegetation wouldn't interfere with our signal, so they can communicate properly. Plus, the transmission time of the how long that UAV is sitting atop the, uh, each sensor node. We had to make it a, a very precise, so they wouldn't be hovering there for a very long time. Uh, here are our marketing requirements. Just a few I'm going to mention that we're going to talk about more is uh, the sensor nodes will, will have to support multiple sensors, in this case, soil moisture, temperature, and humidity. The user will receive that, uh, the data from, a mobile, from the mobile node's SD card. And the uh, sensor nodes will be placed in weatherproof casings because they're going to be outdoors. Um, so here are a few of the re engineering requirements we set out for our project. A few of them to know. Uh, one of them is that we wanted to be able to transmit the data from at least 300 feet, that way the um, UAV could fly over any tree and it would, be, it would just successfully transmit the data with no problem. Um, another one is that each sensor node could support at least three sensors, because um, the more sensors you have, the more useful the, your uh, device is, um, and that way we could do the temperature, soil moisture, and uh, humidity. And then our last one is that um, we wanted the sensor nodes to be powered through um, solar, power, solar charged batteries. Here are the actual sensors we're using. On the left is the temperature sensor, in the middle is the humidity, and the far right is soil moisture. The humidity and the soil moisture sensors are, uh, require both an I2C interface. Uh, they're all weatherproof, by the way. And then the temperature sensor on the left has a one-wire interface, so it just has a one digital wire, and then, of course, BCC and ground. Um, we had to calibrate our sensors. Um, so for the temperature sensor, we just did the simple ice bath technique, just have a, a cup of water with the correct ice and, or, yeah, ice and water ratio. Uh, for the soil moisture, we compared it with a HydroSense 2, like a high-tech uh, soil water sensor at the Pepperwood Preserve. And then for a humidity sensor, we at the Pepperwood Preserve, they have a Dwight Weather Station, and we just compared their humidity result. You can find this online at, on their website. And we just ran a test on our, our humidity sensor. We compared results there. Uh, so we did a few long-term tests and power tests. We found the device, uh, sensor node device, uses 130 milliamps to uh, fully operate. 
Um, and we also found that in direct sunlight, the solar panel produces around 500 milliamp, um, 500 milliamps. Uh, so the LiPo battery we're using is a 1200 milliamp hour battery. Uh, it takes six to eight hours to charge in full sunlight and will last at least eight hours without sun. Um, so we actually set up um, our sensor node outside. And uh, as you can see here, we have, um, obviously at night there's no sun, but when uh, sun rises around like uh, six or between six and seven, um, it got to, like the, our device was still kind of in the shade, so that's why I would say partial sun. Um, around like one or two, it was in full sun until um, it got to sunset. Um, around uh, 7 and then there was no sun. Um, so this is what our, the data we collected uh, once we ran our device. Um, it's, we started at 9 in the morning and it went to 5 the ne next morning. Um, that lasted 20 hours. Um, unfortunately, we realized um, that this, the, uh, the battery size we're using is not quite big enough. Um, it almost reached the sunrise um, but was not um, not big enough to do so in the future and um, if we had a bigger budget we kind of uh, ran out of money and these batteries we um, we were using were kindly donated to us um, we would probably use at least a 2000 milliamp battery or 2500 so next we wanted to do is we need to test the range of these XP's and while they did claim they could do a nine mile transmission that's like perfect everything so we need to make sure you know what is it like in the real world and so what we did is we basically created a, a makeshift mobile node and a makeshift sensor node. And using a program called XTCU, we were able to measure the transmission power uh, between the two. And we just measured it over various distances across campus. And we were able to, uh, and while you can see there is some uh, decrease in the transmission, uh, in the signal over the distance, it wasn't enough to really uh, make the transmission impossible and we were able to go up to over 500 feet and still get a perfectly clean signal with little to no error. We even actually went to 1,000 feet and had to give up because we just ran out of space on campus. And um, so, and we promised that we need at least 300 feet, so we, that was a successful test. But then we also needed to be able to test the uh, transmission time because, as we have said before, uh, we're a bit limited by the battery life of the UAV. It only can fly for 20 minutes at a time, so we can't have it hovering there for minutes and minutes trying to do some big transmission of a huge packet. So we need to make sure it can actually, uh, we'll have enough time to do the entire flight. So what we did is we did a, a simulation of a worst case scenario where the UAV is not even stopping, it's just doing a flyby. And we, so we measured that for various uh, GPS radius because uh, the transmission only happens within a certain radius just to ensure a good transmission. So in our worst case, the worst worst case scenario, at a radius of only 80 meters uh, with the UAV traveling about 10 meters per second and a transmission rate of 25,000 uh, bits per second, which had a total contact time of 12 seconds, it was able to transmit 39,000 bytes of data, which in our case, the size of our packets was is more than enough. So even in a worst case scenario, we should be okay. Um, so we also did a field test where we, this is our first test where we used the UAV from Aerotestra. And so we went out with um, on a big open field with um, Sean Hedrick and uh, we had one sensor node we put on the ground, that's the one you see here on the left. Um, and then we also attached a mobile node and we put on the UAV and we had the UAV fly over the sensor node um, three times. First time we had it hover above at uh, 90 feet for five minutes, second time 50 feet for three minutes, and third test uh, 50 feet for one minute. Um, so basically this test was so just to see if the, all the data from the sensor node would transmit to the um, mobile node, it did, so it was, it was successful. Um, however, when we looked at the data, we noticed there was some data corruption. That was not from the height, or that was not from the uh, time above the sensor. It was actually due to the, some error in our code, and we later fixed that. Um, so, but this showed that our test was successful. Next, once we got sort of everything set up, and we actually had a fully built sensor node and mobile node, we decided that we need to do a good real test. Unfortunately, we didn't have access to the UAV at the time, so we decided to do sort of something similar where we just tested across campus with a car. And so we set it up one sensor node down by the Student Center, one by Ives Hall, and one over by the Green Center. And the uh, one to the left is uh, for a 50-foot radius, and the one on the right is for a 200-foot radius GPS proximity. And so what we wanted to do is be able to test that GPS proximity 
of the uh, mobile node and also just see how we can handle having a moving mobile node because everything we were just testing was just in the lab than being stationary. And so it was a very successful test. Uh, we, aside from some hiccups along the way, we managed to make it so it was a successful transmission of all three without even having to stop. It just boom, 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 each one was able to get the data. So here's our sensor node in its complete form. It's also on display at our table. Um, the case uh, with the yellow lid there, it's a PVC case. It has four holes on it. It was meant for to put conduit tubes, but we used it just to put our sensors coming out from each from a certain hole. And the holes that we weren't using, you, they, they also came with these weather, weatherproof stoppers that you place on them. Um, you can also see the uh, solar panel that's mounted on there and the uh, XB's antenna coming out from the, the, t the hole on top. So what we did is that we drilled it onto a, just a regular piece of uh, plywood. And then from there, we just put, we actually put hinges on the other side. And that way, you just put it on a, on a, on a U-post and then have it outdoors. Um, and then on the right is every, all the circuitry that was able to fit into the sensor node to the, into the case. So that was, that was holding our UC32 um, with all the sensors plus the power circuit as well. So once we actually got to use the UAV, um, we actually went down to the Fairfield Osborne Reserve and basically recreated our test that we did on campus, but this time with the actual UAV. We mounted it onto it and we programmed the three GPS coordinates that we had set our sensor nodes at to on, on the uh, at the preserve, uh, we set up a 200 foot GPS radius for each of them and then just had it autonomously fly to each. Uh, we ran into some small problems with uh, powering it from the UAV and uh, through a bit of engineering and some jerry-rigging, we managed to get uh, function and we were able to do a successful test where the drone flew to each one, stopped for about 10 seconds each and came back and we had a successful packet of data. So our, our estimated budget of parts was about $633. The actual cost, if somebody would like to actually build this whole thing from scratch, it cost them about $991, a uh, pretty big number. But I'd like to note that uh, some various sensors, the more the expensive ones, were donated to us. And then we got a lot of our parts from on sale as well. So I'm not going to bore you with the specifics of our uh, schedule, but basically, to sum it up, um, I did most of the work for the mobile node. Josh and Abe did a lot of work for the sensor nodes with Abe constantly. Abe <laughs> concentrating <laughs> on the uh, sensors and the XB programming and Josh concentrating on a lot of the powers for the solar. Um, some of the roadblocks we hit along the way was, um, turns out uh, interfacing an SD card to a microcontroller is really hard. It's a lot more difficult than you think it would be. So we actually ran into a lot of issues just getting that to function. And then we also ran into a roadblock where uh, the handshake between the mobile and sensor nodes, uh, we ran into a problem where we were either transmitting too fast and overflowing the buffer or transmitting too slow and it was just taking too long. And then um, the power was just sort of an ongoing part that just took most uh, like slowly throughout the, the entire process. Um, so there's a lot of stuff we learned from this project. Uh, one of them is that you want to document everything. When you're out in the field and you're doing a test, you want to make sure you have a notepad ready so you can write down the results. That way you're not left uh, guessing what the results were from the past. Um, another one, we just like pre more practical. We learned how to use a GPS module. We learned how to use sensors and calibrate them. and we also um, learned how to power devices through a solar panel. And one of the other more important ones is how to manage time. Uh, I think it was really important that we, um, we were able to set a goal for each week and then try to accomplish that goal. I think that really set us um, ahead and we were able to get a lot done that way. So for future work on this project, uh, one thing we like to do is make it completely autonomous. While the UAV does fly itself, you still have to do the initial takeoff and you still have to go out to it and get the SD card and everything. We would like to maybe make it so that if it just landed on its charging pad by itself, did this every month or so for you and they would just stream it to a computer. Um, we'd also maybe like to have a system where it's easier to set up the GPS coordinates because currently you have to do it by hand. Um, and maybe also switch over from the UC32 and WF32 boards to independent microcontrollers, which would make it a lot cheaper and a lot smaller. I'd like to thank all of our advisors, especially Mr. Sean Hedrick, to let us uh, use his UAV from Mayor Testra. I'd like to thank Suzanne DeCorsi of the Fairfield Osborne Preserve, uh, Mesa, and Dr. Carolyn Peruta for donating uh, various uh, sensors to us, uh, the source funding, and our families and friends for the support. Any questions? So you're saying using like a satellite connection or a, no, a cellular connection? A cellular GPS, connection? With GPS, because these days you get a board of microcontroller unit as well as the GPS. You push the data to the cloud and then you can map that process. 
we did some research into that, but the thing about that is that then you'll have to pay to use the cellular service. And so in this case, it's completely independent of that. It's, it's just your own network. So, I mean, you could do that, but then you would just be paying monthly fees for that. Yes, for client purpose, you know, machine to machine uh, connections is a new carrier, no? it travels about less than a 10 dollars. Fair enough. <laughs> Actually, if I can respond to that, and one of our requirements was that they not do that. Because, <laughs> no, it's a great idea. I completely agree. But some of the natural areas we work in um, prohibit cellular connections. You know, we can't even get a free point then. So, so it was actually a requirement. Any other questions? Yes. Um, so if you have other ZigBee um, communication sensors out there that are independent from yours, can you, is there a um, chance that you have crosstalk or any interference from other communication sensors? Uh, we did a bit of testing on that, and it can, it is possible, but it's not totally going to happen. We did, um, the UAV actually uses the same uh, ZigBee protocol, and it actually did not interfere with it at all. And the main thing is, um, our uh, ours only does transmissions like once a month, and so the chance of that happening is a bit slim. And also, ours uh, only communicates; it uses a flag to make sure that it doesn't <coughs> accidentally communicate to something else that's not supposed to communicate with. That, that's also how we're able to do. Um, if some of the sensor nodes are really close together and they're still in the same proximity, that way, like even if they're if it, the UAV is in the same like spot. Um, it only go to one of them because it's only looking for that one flag. For like, so for like sensor one node, it would send a one, or and two it would send a two. So it's just looking for those flags, and that's how we manage that. And for security reasons, um, you program or you configure the XBs through a program called XCTU, and you can set certain net IDs. So in that whole in our mesh, should be a, that they have the same same net ID. Someone could have their own sensor node with an XB, and they could find ours, but they aren't. They can't necessarily um, tap into that data. Anything else? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Our, uh, the, what we learned the most, well, I know everyone said this a million times over, but uh, research. I mean, it, I, I know you've all warned us about this at the start of this, of this project, too, that research, 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 and we didn't listen. <laughs> you have to do research. We, we just, uh, especially like the SD card, I, my assumption was, oh, this would be so easy. It's an SD card. What's the, how hard could it be? No, it's much more complicated than you think. Also, we start uh, timing. We uh, with we started the semester and this semester we're like oh we'll have it done within a month it's this is a simple project it can't be that bad three months later we're still trying to figure out how to make the handshake work and have the power supply working so it's just you know you never know what you're running into there's always something just something goes wrong something you don't anticipate and so you have to just really make sure you plan things correctly and and, and also plan for things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. For me, there's a very big difference between the um, your prototype or your uh, item and the breadboard, breadboard form and the actual form. So I, I wish I could have made the actual, um, the, the complete form a while back. That way we can get more testing done with the actual form that people are gonna see and where you're gonna present rather than the, the <coughs> breadboard form, the prototype. Anything else? Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to let you know that we had actually one person who was supposed to keep track of timing, and that was the sign. But, you know, he never used this. And that speaks of the professionalism that's gone through throughout these projects. Every project was exactly on time. So we never had to use any of these. So thank you, all of, thanks to all of our students and the audience, of course. Oh, he also had that. <laughs> anyway, uh, with the end of these presentations comes the conclusion of this year's senior design projects. Uh, for many of our students who are graduating in May, this is also the beginning of a new journey. Uh, on behalf of the faculty, I want to emphasize how proud we are of our students' achievements and their efforts over the last, say, four maybe five, maybe six, seven, who knows, years of their career at SSU. Um, at this point, I would like to ask all of our adjunct faculty in the audience to please stand up. Um, I want to call up on Dr. Ali Kujuri, 
one of our faculty professors, Dr. As Estrich, Dr. Rahimi, Dr. Betts in the back, and also Professor Decker and Cassis who are not here. Uh, on behalf of the department, I would like to thank all of you for your invaluable contributions to the department and particularly to these projects. These projects would not be possible without your involvement and many hours of voluntary service. So thank you so much. So last but not least, please join me to give a big round of applause for Mr. Shalom Marijuani oh, yeah. and yeah. Ronnie Goodland. And where is Ronnie? And also, I want to thank Joshua uh, Papa Nicholas for really, he was the one that sort of started this whole idea of let's go out. It's boring to stay in room 2001 in Salazar building. So thanks to all of you. So with that, um, thank you again for sticking around until 1.30. Uh, we are a little late. And I hope we see all of you next year here. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us.